Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and joining me for a bumper breakdown, uh, leaving October 2024 in our wake, moving into what I'm sure is going to be a very quiet and uneventful November for the whole world, uh, is Dan. Dan, welcome. Hey, hey, it's uh, it's good to be here. We have a, a lot to get through. Yeah, tons. We were going to do a double recording, weren't we? This and then, as I'll mention at the end again, the the UAP hearings preview pod. But there's so much to get through here, including listener content. Um, It's probably going to take a while. So this might be two parts, might be three, might be ten. Who knows? Um. But yeah, let's just five minutes each. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? It might end up actually being the opposite of normal and be really short. And it's like, oh, it's like 12 <laughs> minutes in. That's that done. Um, but a lot to get through. And Dan, we're going to start off uh with probably one of the biggest podcast episodes of all time that took place just recently. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah I would um, agree with that. Yeah, I had Sarah Gam on. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I am, of course, talking about uh, Joe Rogan podcast on the 25th of October, hosting former President Donald Trump, I think is how you say it, or President Donald Trump, or Donald Trump, depending how I much you like I think just president. Yeah, president? that's fair, though. Yeah, I think you have to say that in the States. We don't have to say that here, okay? Trump, Donald Trump, the guy from Donald. Home Alone. Yeah, the Don. The guy who owns that golf course in Scotland. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm just going to go with Trump. Uh, Trump and Rogan. So... There's not a whole lot to discuss and dissect. I think the main meat for, for what we are talking here is the UFO stuff, Dan. It was kind of a six or seven minute segment uh, where he gets asked about the, or he brings up the JFK files. And basically mm -hmm. as a as an election ploy, as every politician does, he's going to tease something. But what a cool thing to tease. He says, I'm going to open up the JFK files, um, which while strictly not UFO related, conspiracy one of the most famous incidents of all time uh, jfk getting shot um and rogan i thought rogan was reasonably good at holding his kind of feet to the flames and saying you know why didn't you do it first time round? you had your chance donald trump does a donald trump and kind of talks around that um but then funnily enough rogan goes to bring up the alien stuff and trump preempts it and basically his wording is you know um a lot of interest in people coming from space and he looks up you know, to tonight they're coming from yeah. above. In, interesting um, wording, right? Yeah. Um. Yes, but no. It's uh, it's exactly yeah, how sure. Donald Trump <laughs> would talk about it. You know. So um, and very much a case of you know how Joe Rogan says to him, how much did he tell you? Donald Trump says a lot. Um. But again, for me, Donald Trump from the beginning, and loads of people asked about asked about the, these comments and to discuss it he said the same thing and he's been pretty consistent with the whole ufo subject of i've never been a believer you know he's yeah. he's always kind of said something along the lines of i'm not really into it i don't really believe it's not really my thing but then he goes on to to rightly say the pilots are credible folks and people have spoken to him about it um and that if indeed he gets voted in he'll he'll go through the files i think he's just saying what people want to hear in that respect though so um not a whole lot to it but that was one of the biggest podcast episodes of any podcast of all time um so it was worth bringing up dan your thoughts on that anything different yeah i mean you know the jfk stuff was interesting because he said that he would release that before he was elected last time and of course he he didn't release everything but in this episode he kind of he pins it all on his advisors saying that he couldn't because there were there were names of living people in the files and, and that's a big no-no apparently um and that totally applies to the ufo stuff because even, even if we look at the uap disclosure act that was uh you know trying to go through that was based on the same legislation wording wise as the the jfk release legislation mm -hmm. Um, so, so there's similarities there with this subject and, you know, JFK is kind of tied up with the whole UFO thing. You know, there are rumors that, um, JFK knew something and he, he was going to try and bring it all out or, you know, interfere with the military industrial complex. And that's what led to, to him being offed. Um, that's also, yeah, they, you can go wild with it, can't you? That he told Marilyn Monroe stuff about it. Yeah, and, that one too. In yeah. the pillow talk and Marilyn had to be off as well. Like it goes as big as you want it, right? Like we, we yeah. don't have the information, so we can we can just fill that gap with with as much as we want. Um, yeah, I was surprised that it was only a few minutes, but I think it's possible Rogan kind of cottoned on that Trump wasn't interested, as as Trump said, you know, it's never been my thing. Um, that's a crazy thing 
to hear for me because we're talking about the you know uh the united states defending itself of securing its airspace and the pilots kind of having to swerve to miss these these uap that they're encountering and he's just like yeah it's not really my thing and it's just like it doesn't matter if it's your thing right like this is an important national security issue just because you're not into space you're not gonna go eh, it's not really my thing to just track satellites of other countries so i just i don't i don't look at those reports you know Maybe not folks listening to this or watching this, right? But there's a lot of folks in the public that that maybe does still echo their own views around the UFO topic that, you know, it's not my thing. And it could or will affect them, you know, as and when you get disclosure, capital D disclosure, all that kind of stuff. But there's still a malaise and still a disinterest from a lot of folks around the topic. So it's not necessarily a, a, a shocking point of view from that sense, but I suppose if you take away the fact the guy was and could be the next president again, yeah, as in that respect, but but also the, the not. commander in chief should be the guy who who's got all these issues kind of you know being addressed and unbuttoned up, so to speak. Um, but plenty others have never seemed to care or bother. Yeah, or no, this, this is it. true. This is true. You, you know the the narrative is that behind closed doors this is spoken about a lot but public facing you know no one wants to address it for stigma and things like that or because they're just not that interested right they've got other things that are more pressing um like nuclear issues with china and the war in israel and and stuff like that um yeah so so he had trump says that he interviewed pilots um joe obviously rattles off all the names of the pilots that he's had on the podcast um i'd recommend everyone go listen to those pilots and, and in their own words kind of hear their experiences uh commander fravor who encountered the tic tac ryan graves who squadron encountered the the gimbal um and the go fast kind of videos so the uap in those videos um and uh, i i was delighted to find out <laughs> There was a point where Trump says, you know, they're round balls. That's a good shape, you know. And I was like, cool, Trump, Trump likes round things. That, that's great. Um, but four times faster than F-22, he, you know, he cheered that. So at the very least, he's getting some sort of information on it or got some sort of information on it. I don't think we've heard that specific thing before. Um, and they, there was also a moment where, and again, you've got to hold this lightly because of who's saying it. Um, but when Joe asserted that, we've been to mars and we haven't found life there trump says maybe there's life there that we don't know and you know it's a pig's ear of a sentence but essentially he's getting at the whole idea of there could be a form of life that we're not aware is life and this is something we've touched on before you, you know and lou talks about it grush talks about it you, you know gary nolan talks about it um when we encounter something alien we won't necessarily recognize it right away um mm. but yeah it, it's that that was the I guess the main gist of it. Um, I, I would have been really interested. Joe's last question to him was, could it be something that's a military program and and Trump kind of swerves it into criticizing Biden? But I would have been really interested to hear the answer to that question. Yeah, um, very much remains to be seen regardless who gets into office, how that will affect the UFO conversation at all. Um, I, for one, will be glad when the elections are done. As we're recording this, Dan, it's just over a week from now. Um, and yeah, whether you're voting red, blue or whatever, um, best of luck, have fun. And we could all crack on with, you know, the rest of our lives afterwards. Um, but yeah, it's a yeah. pretty important issue. But from a UFO point of view, let's hope it doesn't whatever happens affects anything that's going to happen down the line from from a positive ufo um interaction um dan another dan danny sheehan was on the julian dory podcast um very much on the mold of the joe rogan podcast but without joe rogan and a guy called julian dory um danny um i'm not going through i've not watched the whole thing just a few clips of danny chatting about some stuff but uh some incredible claims from Danny Sheehan, which mm -hmm. some people hate, some people love. And it's not unfair to say for people like us, Dan, it's great to discuss because some wonderful... Danny's really good not necessarily being subtle with what he says. And I love yes. the fact he'll just come out with, you know, mantis people. 
And it's like, ah, you know, <laughs> mean, yep, full on insectoid mantis type being, seven foot tall, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think the standouts for me there, Dan, were Danny talked about mantis people. Um, I wonder though, with some of the things, just to caveat this, Danny Sheehan, we've touched on this before, has been around so many different people involved in the UFO topic for so many decades. You've got to wonder how, but he's a very, very clever guy. Let's not forget that. He's incredibly well qualified and it's not as if he's not switched on for love of god um how some of those conversations sometimes may bleed into each other and we've mentioned how bits of fact checked knowledge in his head where he has seen verified documentation testimony video whatever it may be can bleed into something he's been told off someone else who he believes but hasn't necessarily had the chance to fact check it. I don't know. Um, and I just wonder sometimes when I listen to this stuff, I think that's always in the back of my head that Same. with anyone, I don't 100% go, I believe them because that person's saying it. But you've just got like your kind of own little thing in the back of your head that ticks over, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in the clip that you're talking about, Danny mentions that he doesn't go and see UFO movies and stuff like that because he doesn't, he is words are i don't gobble it up with other stuff you don't want to poison your mind with that so i think he's cognizant of trying things keep things separate yeah. but we're all human you, you know oh, like yeah. we all do it right um and and it's hard like you hear so much stuff even you know not being superstar ufo lawyer um you see we're all you, human you just pick bits not, up. <laughs> not mantis people not the mantis, not the mantis people. people no they, there um, was something with the mantis people that i liked that he said or he said mantis people and then he went on to describe that they're called that because how they look reminds people of praying mantis. So, and, and I think, that, yeah. So I think that gets kind of lost sometimes that, you know, people just think, oh, the giant praying mantis. And it's like, eh, not exactly. There's going to be a quality to them that kind of mm. reminds people of that. And yeah, it's worth, I think, mentioning. He, he calls them insectoids. Yeah. Um, I, I assume, you know, hard shells, pincers, maybe the head is the same shape and they're tall and gangly or something. Um, I mean, that's still yeah. pretty man, just like Dan. That's not, that's yeah. not, <laughs> <laughs> it is, hard but they're not just head. giant versions of the things that we know from here, you know. Are you, that, that is almost though what you've described exactly down to the T. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I described a praying mantis, you're right. <laughs> you did, you did like, yeah. Um, no subtlety whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but he does mention, again, to carry on the, the lack of subtlety, which I love, that there's a carrier group deployed off of Guadalupe Island that monitors an underwater non-human intelligence base under the sea. Um, he mentions also uh, that there are hundreds of UAP tracked going in and out of the water there. There's also another base outside of Sedona, Arizona, where there are craft and also where Mantis people are based. I love saying that phrase. Um, to take this back to, I don't want to say reality, because that, that's, you know, being disrespectful to the comments and not to say they aren't true, but it's the kind of stuff that I think we probably need to hear said by officials in hearings to get people to take this kind of stuff more seriously. Otherwise, the public and a lot of UFO folks will take it more lightly or with a pinch of salt. Is that fair? Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, I, I think the the carrier stuff was he talked about the Tic Tac, and that's where you know the Nimitz and the Princeton were. Um, Kevin Day, who was on radar, yeah, for those encounters, described that these craft went into the water, and he says that he tracked hundreds over days until he tasked the planes with going to look. So that could just be that you you know, um, but we've heard that time and time again that you know they disappeared by Guadalupe. There are lava tubes there. So they could be going into underwater bases that are through those tubes and so on and so forth. But Sedona was interesting. Um, Sedona's, it's really remote. Uh, you, you know, I, I got to go there with, with Elena when we tracked across America, one of my favorite places in, in the whole country. It was just gorgeous. But what I loved about it was that by law, they have to turn all their lights off because they value their night sky. Mm. And so you combine that you know, being able to see the Milky Way there and everything in the night sky with the fact that, you know, Danny says here that it's, it's probably the the most, that UFOs are sighted most in Sedona out of anywhere in the USA. Or maybe, sorry, Danny didn't say it. I, I had a little Google afterwards okay. and, and I found a number of sources that said that. Um, And so those two things kind of, you know, 
go go together like peanut butter and jelly really uh you know a clear view of the night sky a supposed et base or alien base uh it's exactly where you would see them and it being law makes me think huh you know is there something else at play there you know do are the lights turn down for a particular reason if there's a lot of activity especially when it comes to military activity and stuff like that um they go into my labs here and stuff like that but i did come across a place called uh, bradshaw ranch that was near the secret mountain uh, which is it's like forty-seven thousand acre wilderness just in the middle of like this national park which is it's just enormous you, you know you, you could hide there if you wanted to mm -hmm. uh, quite easily and bradshaw ranch is basically sedona's skinwalker ranch to take a shortcut cattle mutilations being sighted um energy vortexes uh even down to i found some reports that said people had seen dinosaurs and you know silly on the face of it but when you remember that at skinwalker ranch they saw dino beavers beaver. yes exactly it, it's not a stone's throw right um i'm not going to describe dinosaurs verbatim again like i do with the mantises but uh but it's the same kind of thing you know that's the yeah. language people are reaching for because that's what looks familiar to them so i found that really interesting and the Bradshaw Ranch was actually sold off by the owners because they had a lot of weird stuff that they kind of didn't want to be around. And it was rumored that the government purchased it. And it's now owned by uh, Northern Arizona University, who there's all the, like these, you know, don't trespass, keep out kind of signs up mm -hmm. because they're doing supposedly environmental studies on the fauna and rare species there, which anyone that's read Secret Machines well, you know, the ears will twitch at that because that's exactly what Secret Machines described, that big swaths of land purchased by the government saying they're doing environmental studies. And actually, there's something more going on with UFOs in those areas. So is it fair to say with that kind of discussion, that doesn't turn you off the UFO conversation when you hear, you know, mantis people, underwater, non-human intelligence bases, bases inside of mountains, craft going in and out of mountains, you're you're quite happy and open to hearing all that kind of stuff yeah yeah i'm i'm comfortable with it but i'm also when i read that stuff really cognizant that that's exactly the kind of stuff that you know if i spoke to someone that isn't into this subject that's a red line for a lot of people where their eyes yeah. glaze over the second you say mantis being or you know people so dinosaurs they're, they're just like no i'm out like that that's ridiculous i i can't do that anymore yeah it's funny where everyone's line is with that kind of stuff isn't it um so yeah um Speaking of those lines, Dan, uh, let's move on then to comment from, and I formatted this in a way that I hope it kind of makes sense, folks, as we go through. <laughs> Steve Bassett, um, I love Stephen Bassett, and I'll get him back on soon, because I would have Steve on once a month for a disclosure update, because he's great to listen to. He's so positive and enthusiastic and knowledgeable. Um, I think a lot of folks would say that Steve always leans on the side of disclosure is just around the corner, and I'm sure he truly hopes it is. He has the best intentions with this and uh, and everything else. So I really like Steve. But he did say, and I'm going to quote Dan, there is an expanding rumor, confirmation of an off-earth civilization is pending. Many news articles are turning up. If true, this would fit the predictions and likely be known for some time or have been known for some time. Timing is perfect as such an announcement now would soften disclosure. I think this is getting lumped in because I saw loads of comments on it around all the stuff that was coming out with the James Webb, the Simon Holland stuff. I think this is just a bit of a bit of a cycle when lumped into the same bag. Um, that do you think we're always going to get this rumor now because of the James Webb, especially being up there? That the next big announcement from the James Webb is always going to be it's found an alien civilization or an alien ship or something like that. Yeah, probably. I, I think you're right on the money there. You, you know, this BCL1 signal, that, that's the one that everyone was kind of talking about. Um, it, it's provided a lot of a lot of YouTubers, a lot of hours of content to talk about. And that's cool. You know, ask the questions, discuss it. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but we also have to, you know, defer to the experts and the teams and the scientists that are pouring out these papers that say, you, you know, very often this stuff kind of they'll study it and find out that you know someone had a microwave on in the cafeteria and their machinery was picking up that kind of signal and yeah. stuff like that so they're working to kind of cut those things out of the equation before they would make any kind of announcement 
but to what you said, I, I think that we're, we're just in an age now where we've got so much advanced equipment and we have so many satellites and things like the James Webb up there searching for these signals that we're more likely to find something like that than ever. So to me, it always is kind of like a broken clock. You know, it's just everyone's just going to keep saying it. And then when it comes out, they're all going to go, I was right, when really they were just throwing data at DARPA blindly. Um, we'll, we'll find it if it's out there because we're looking more than ever. And that's just a kind of logical thing to me, you, you know? So I think this train will just kind of keep on going with new claims and so on and so forth. But as as always, we, we've got to defer to the experts because when you read these papers, even if you're fairly switched on to this stuff, there's so much you won't understand in those papers, uh, you know, subtleties and things like that. And like I said, it can come down to something as dumb as someone leaving a microwave open or, you know, something like that. So yeah, we always have to just let the experts do their work and try not to be sensational about these things. I'm just going to uh, do something here, Dan. Yeah, I've I've always believed that myself, and I think it's on the money. Yeah, Dan, <laughs> I've never believed any of that and think it's absolute nonsense. And I'm just going to go back and delete one of those. When the thing comes. <laughs> and, and Andy was it. right, t-shirt incoming. <laughs> so uh, either way, either way, yeah. Either um, way, he got it. You know those, you know those t-shirts you get where on one side it's like Spider Man, and then you rub your hands on the the little things and they move, and then it's like the Hulk. I'm going to have one of those. <laughs> But it's like UFOs are fake, UFOs are real, like either side. We can, we can do it like sequins, you know, like those pillows. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what we'll like you get Spider Man sequin faces, then you do it. And it's oh, like no, I have not. No. Yeah. You don't go to Primark enough. Um, no, I don't. Really. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Having young kids, I'm always in these areas. Um, otherwise, it's just creepy. Um, and uh, moving on, Dan, I don't know if you watched Need to Know um, with Richard Dolan, if you had a chance to catch that. I know there's a I lot. Did not. It's on my list. Yeah, that, yeah. Do you know what? Worth watching, definitely. Um, so Richard Dolan on Need to Know with uh, Bryce Zabel and Ross Coulter. Folks, just I'm going to help out Bryce and Ross here as well. Not that they need it, um, but they have asked folks to check out. If you're subscribed to their YouTube channel, they've moved it from Bryce's channel to its own new Need to Know. Um, and there's also... There's other podcasts called Need to Know that have been around for a while who are nothing to do with UFOs. But if you go just type in Need to Know on YouTube, you'll see, I'm pretty sure it's got about 8,000 subscribers at the minute, which is way off what they get normally for views. Um, so just go and check out the new YouTube channel. They're just trying to stress it's got its own own home now on YouTube. Okay. Um, but yeah, Richard Dolan, USOs talk about un uh, unidentified submerged objects, uh, unidentified, yeah, Um under the water, basically. Going to start out, Dan, pointing out that they do mention their much-loved book, AD After Disclosure, which was co-authored, Dan, by Bryce and Richard. You won't have known that, but I've let you I know now. I have no idea. No, no, I know now, though. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> really interesting chat. They go through some different cases. Do you know what was really weird for me, purely from a podcasting point of view? It's probably the least I've ever heard Ross talk on any of his shows because oh. Bryce, Bryce and Richard go do a lot of the back and forward. Um, and then Ross kind of comes in. Um, but uh, yeah, Richard Dolan, when I spoke to him, I think it was earlier this year, way earlier last year, uh, this year or towards the end of last year, mentioned he was writing a new book on USOs and he's confirmed with uh, Richard and Bryce. It's now going to be a three volume series. He's written over a thousand pages with over oh, 600 wow. cases he's looked at. Um, so it's, I think the first one is potentially coming out, he says next month which I'm going to take to be November. Um, so look out for information on that. Um, the general interview, it's what you would expect, but an uh, interesting quote and then an idea to discuss, Dan, from it. Dolan sure. did say, at some point, you do want to update the cover-up. And I thought that was a really interesting way of looking at it. And I wondered, is the whole scenario just now we're looking at, and we're going to talk about hearings soon, and they're obviously the big news on the on the horizon in about a week's uh, two weeks time. Could that be potentially a reason that things are happening the way they are? That it is time to update the cover up for the gatekeeper's point of view. And we're going to have to devil's advocate this here a little bit because it is speculation and probably more on the negative side of things. But what's your thoughts on that? I just thought it was an interesting idea. Yeah, that that is interesting, and we we've definitely touched on this in some ways. There was a a part um, from the Julian Dory podcast with Sheehan where Sheehan kind of says that he says 
you know, think about all these government whistleblowers that are coming out now and saying, you, you know, oh, we, we feel bad. We want to tell you things, but we can't reveal everything. So we're just going to tell you some things. And to that, it kind of it paints a particular picture. Right. And I, I think we we have to pay attention to to the things that aren't being said, you know, the unknown unknowns, <laughs> as, it, as it's uh, called. Um, as well as the things that are being said, because, yeah, we we live in a different time now. We have different expectations about, you know, looking out into the universe and being connected as we were. And skeptics always like to trot out that whole, you know, we, we've got camera phones now. So why isn't there a picture of these things? So come swinging in with low observability right there. You, you know, like we, we can build. You could build a new story that kind of explains a lot of these blind spots and keeps keeps the keeps the cover up going for a while longer yeah because all they have to do is kick it down the road kick the can down the road a little bit it's not as if they have to cover this up for 20 more years it can just be they feel they're at a potential tipping point or fork in the road so and i'm not saying this is what's happening but it's an interesting thing to think about that let's manipulate the situation as it is to just delay things a few years and that'll be enough to take the heat off of things because if we do find that we end up in a little bit of a cycle now from last year to this year to next year the year after of we've got hearings nothing really comes of it we've got hearings nothing really comes of it uap disclosure act doesn't pass doesn't pass doesn't pass you do get people cooling off from that don't you and we yeah. could go to a time let's let's just pick 2028 20, right 2027 20, stuff that we'll get to later on dan comes and goes nothing happens we have no significant disclosure we have maybe the same quality of videos get I mean, another few videos get released we have grush releases a book maybe but it has a similar reaction i think to what lou elizondo's books had a lot of interest but has it has it moved a needle? I don't think you can say it has. Um, I don't think any book would anyway. I think we've said that plenty of times before. So say we get to 2028, 2029, there's almost a potential that you're going back through a new cycle of Elizondo, Grush, Mellon aren't part of the conversation anymore. And that goes, they go down in history as what an interesting time those guys came forward but the gatekeepers and the secret keepers kind of won you know that the ufo conversation carries on as it is loads of folk think that'll be the case because they have seen this happen time and time and time again um it's just an interesting idea that i, I like i like that but obviously at some point you you do want to update the cover up and i was like could that be an element of what's going on and look the more people that say disclosures round the corner, disclosures coming soon, you know, maybe there's less control of that than we want or hope. But just purely from a devil's advocate yeah. point of view, not to put a downer and on it, folks. We've we've discussed before as well the idea that you know, say say this all began. I know it didn't begin in the forties; it goes way way back. But you know, say the cover up began in the forties, mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to reveal stuff and we, we always hear people saying oh nothing's changed we had officials talking about this stuff back then and like yeah fine we we did but maybe the world wasn't ready maybe the reaction to it wasn't what they wanted in terms of like a litmus test you know pull a little bit out if the public respond well then you pull a little bit more out and if the public respond well you put a little bit more out and we they, they could just have on their calendars you know the secret keepers um that every five years they just they drip a little bit more out and they gauge the reaction to it and then that kind of in a way is updating the cover up every time right you're giving a little bit more information whether it's true or not don't know it wouldn't necessarily have to be we spoke about this with immaculate constellation you, you know it's easy enough to like throw a bunch of whistleblowers that pretend yeah. not to know each other at someone well-meaning um but yeah this this kind of drip feed rollout over decades that you update it every now and then to the point where I guess the analogy is a, a lobster in boiling water, right? Like it mm -hmm. doesn't 
that the water is going to get hotter around it and it doesn't necessarily notice it you know a massive kind of increase in temperature yeah so in terms of kind of thinking the secret keepers won there might not be winners and losers in this at all there might just be like a steady walking down a path you, you know yeah and even then when you say they're giving little bits out it's like little bits of how much you know is it yes is it a piece of a 10 piece jigsaw is it one piece of a thousand piece jigsaw part one you know is it's kind of yeah. hard to, hard to even and measure it in that terms or sense um interesting idea though like well i hope it is because it came to me while i was walking the dog and listening to the the podcast i went between my phone youtube on the tv my laptop and <laughs> yeah on a dog walk listening and watching this um thinking about the, again they were focused on usos and talking about underwater equipment and submarines and picking up all that stuff and i wondered is there any element of how much military presence there is in various locations especially underwater is purely down to uso activity or ufo activity and the whole military bravado us russia china thing is more of a front these governments put on when actually they're doing their best to be first on the scene for any ufo activity or crashes or recovery that could happen and i i'd likened it to dan like you know, when you put a submarine in the water, the oceans are, I think, unfathomably big. I think we still struggle that we think we know how big an ocean is, but you, it's just so wild how big they actually are and how 5% of the oceans have actually been, you know, charted or whatever you want to call it or, or checked. Check, or yeah. Whatever you not discovered because we know they're there. It's not like we haven't discovered more of the Pacific yet. It's, it's there, right? But, you know, 5% actually been like kind of someone's been to or been round. And I likened it to panning for gold, you know, where you basically pick up a lot of shit in a pan and you sieve, 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 sieve. There's nothing. You go back to it again. And I'm thinking about all these submarines out and about and all this equipment. Is there any chance a lot of it is less to do with the US and Russia and China patrolling each other and actually more to be the first on the scene or checking for underwater NHI bases, that kind of stuff? Maybe goes a bit more speculative and deep down a Reddit thread there, but just a thought. Well, probably probably a bit of A and B, right? Um, you know, there's probably parts of each government that are working together. We, we've heard, you know, we know they had agreements with uh, nuclear launches going yeah. way back that they would be able to contact each other and go, is this you? And they'd be like, no, we didn't launch anything. It's it's some, something else is going on. Yeah. So there's some level of cooperation between governments, uh, you, you know, even if we don't want to invoke Russia and China, we can talk about Five Eyes and stuff like that. You know, there are these agreements that it's not a crazy thing to, to think that the governments are working together on certain things. But also each of those governments is, you know, it's sovereign, it's its own thing, and they're going to want the advantage. So they'll be keeping little bits of information from each other and probably trying to find, you know, sieve, sieve the river to find the bits of gold and be like, oh, no, there's, there's nothing over here, right? Like. Yeah. Go go down there and check. There's nothing by here while they like just put, fill in their pockets with gold. Mm. So yeah, probably a bit of a bit of B. And yeah, the, the ocean mapping stuff is really interesting because if you look on Google Earth, you can kind of see the whole planet, right? You know, the, it's all mapped according to Google Earth. But the in actuality, planet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in in actuality, they the you know the elusive they the scientists that are doing it um or the companies private companies probably now that are doing it yeah. uh they haven't mapped a lot of the ocean floor because we need tend to map over what we use as opposed to going out of our way so it'll be like mm -hmm. shipping lanes you know they're the first things mapped and stuff like that and then you'll have to get mega funding and loads of equipment to go do the other bits and most of what you see on google maps or google earth of the ocean it's all kind of inferred from changes in ocean depth as the as the water moves over it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, e even though most people out there probably look at Google Earth and kind of go, yeah, we've mapped the whole thing. We we haven't. We genuinely don't know what's down there. And to I guess to bring it back to the UFO bases, there was the case of the the Malibu underwater anomaly that a lot mm -hmm. of people thought was a was an underwater UFO base off the coast. They talk of about that. They talk about that with Dawn and Coulter. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I'll be interested. I'll finish what I'm saying, but I'll be interested to see what yep. they said about it. Um, and a number of people from MUFON got experts and they went out there and they looked. And these geologists basically said that this is exactly what we would expect to see there. You know, these 
the the things that look on Google Earth like uh, a base, like pillars underneath a base, were actually kind of structures for, from like volcanic rock and stuff like that. And the way that the Earth moves, it just produced this shape. Um, and then because the because the map is discerned using a certain technology, you're not actually seeing what's really there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they went to look and they couldn't find anything. But what did those guys say? Mantis people. Mantis people. No, no um, <laughs> mantis-like people. No, um, to be fair, Ross brought it up uh, and Richard said he doesn't think it is something anomalous, but, and it's a nice segue in to talk about Tim Gallaudet. They mention uh, Rear Admiral, former Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, retired, um, who we'll talk about in a second with the hearings, and that he said, and mentioning that previously, the best way to actually find out what it is is to get an ROV, which I'm guessing is remote operated vehicle, and send yes. something down because it's thousands of feet underwater. And that's not as easy to do as you might think. Well, let's go find mm -hmm. someone with lots of money who's happy to spend it. So then you go online and go, okay, ROV.com, you know, Dan. Don't know what rov.com brings you up um if you want to check <laughs> but i'm, I'm guessing just, i'm gonna do it right now <laughs> i'm guessing go for it it's not as easy as finding a website like that you buy it and then they send you the remote control in the vehicle it's probably not going to be the case you can see a massive uh, flash oh, on the screen. oddly oddly enough um it rov.com redirects to uh sabes eai.com which is a company that you can rent an ROV from. Is it? So, yeah. Okay, so I completely take that back. <laughs> ROV.com is essentially the best <laughs> website to go to. Totally going back on what I said before. But it, um, it's like if you watch Skinwalker, right? When they're like, oh, we need to do this ground penetrating radar. They've yeah. got to go to specialists. It costs a whole bunch of money. It's not going to be you and I going, all right, let's do the podcast on site and we're just going to fly to California and find someone with an ROV and throw it down. It's It's not... You, you can't buy a DJI drone that will go underwater. Yeah. You can just do that in an afternoon with $100. It, it's yeah. a very You expensive... need someone to operate it. It's very difficult to operate in the water the deeper you go. It's very dark. And yeah, it's not as if I stick a GoPro on it and film it. So I think they mentioned that you would need some decent equipment, some time, and that involves money, funding, you know, manpower to, to, to do all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, it was an interesting episode, really liked that, and it's good to hear Richard's book is due out, well, part one of three, it sounds like, um, really interesting. And moving into the hearing, so we mentioned there, Dan, Tim Gallaudet, uh, retired Rear Admiral, former Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Deputy NOAA, um, which is the Deputy for the NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a real serious guy. Um, are you? Is it fair to say, and don't just say yes, Tell me if I'm wrong. Yes. He's been around now for a little bit of time, but not overly exposed in terms of the UFO, UAP subject. Um, so I'm intrigued, given he has been confirmed by himself as someone who is testifying at the upcoming hearing on the 13th of November. I'm intrigued to see what he's got to say, because I would hope he will go into some detail that we haven't heard yet. Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say, you know, Elizondo's kind of obviously his book came out and he's kind of known by the wider world, uh, not just the UFO community, yeah. but G Gallaudet is kind of he's specialist right now. You know, if, if you're into this subject, you'll probably know who he is. Um, he's done some talks at conferences, things like that, but he hasn't really kind of made a big splash. And I'm curious well, to hear what he has to say. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um he he'd know where to rent an ROV for what to study. They probably but, own um, one. Yeah, um, but he I can't remember where it was from, but uh, he, literally a quote from him uh, where he said, "I'm totally convinced that we are experiencing a non-human higher intelligence because I know people who were in the legacy programs that oversaw both the crash retrieval and the analysis of the UAP data." So that is, uh, you know, it's an I know someone that knows, but it suggests a deeper level than kind of what he's come out and said so far. So I'd be interested to hear what he has to say uh, under oath. And there was uh, a good appearance from him. We'll get to in a little bit when we talk about Beyond uh, in that show. Mm. Um, but who, who else do you reckon is going to testify? I know. So 
Lou Elizondo hinted in his recent yeah. X space that he, he might be testifying. Um, and he, to be fair, he's kind of got to now because if he hints and then doesn't, that has a look. Sure. So you yeah. would expect him to, to now you be there. wonder why. And unless, I don't know, like if, if we had someone that was a heavy hitter, you, you know, in terms of, say, for example, we only knew Alessandro and he was only going to testify and then Grush came forward and they replaced him with Grush. Yeah. Then I could kind he's of like see backup. the reason in. Like um, someone else steps in. Like he's available, but if... And this, this... Okay, so there are a lot of folks talking that the Tim Burchett and others have mentioned that... It's Tim Burchett, actually, not Burchett. It's Burchett. It was Burchett. Yeah. Definitely Burchett. Um, so him, Luna, and others have said they're, they're keeping the names private, which I think is totally the best way to go with it. They don't want all the names out there as much as we've just went, Galladay and Elizondo are testifying. Um, they've got names here that they're trying to keep quiet to protect them and keep eyes and ears off of them, all that kind of stuff. Um, where was I going with that, Dan? Uh, who did I want? Uh, what was my point there? Remind me. Uh, we were talking about Elizondo testifying. Uh, oh, yeah. So I if they have this list of super secret heavy hitters, like you say, it would make sense to have one or two folks either on standby or almost their own little bit of disinfo to be like, yeah, I'm going to testify. And then they don't because they wanted to make sure that Mary Jones and John Smith actually come forward and testify who last minute could change their mind or someone gets to them not bumps them off but you know totally i really hope otherwise. someone called mary jones or tom smith or john smith that can last you imagine that now people are like andy knew and i'm like i didn't oh, you should be on, yeah andy was right another t-shirt on my t-shirt <laughs> yeah andy was right yep um i'll put it in that to the stars font and start selling it online dan <laughs> yeah we um, should yeah yeah um <laughs> then you sue me um but no so we're going to do a separate hearings podcast previewing the hearings. If anyone's got any thoughts, comments, questions on that, I've got loads already. Um, send those in and we're going to record that on Wednesday, the 30th of October. Um, so some of you might only be hearing this on Wednesday, but send stuff in and I'll put out online for more again. Um, but Dan, you asked me who would I like to see. Mm -hmm. um, of of the names that are out there, uh, how many you want me to pick? Just well, we had three in the last hearing, right? So I think fair. If I could only have three, three. so you've got Galadet. Uh, you you can use Elizondo because he's a maybe. You know, it's just a hint at the moment. But you can sub him if you want. We're going to talk in football terms now. But yeah. who who out of all the names would you fill that last slot with? I guess. Um, Eric Davis. Good shout. Yeah, I'd yeah. I'd want I'd want Eric Davis in there. Um. Admiral Wilson would, would be, I think, a name that if he came out of nowhere to testify, I think that would put the cat amongst the pigeons. Um, I, I'm not sure because he's he's denied it. You know, he's been contacted and he's so, denied but it. Imagine, so he wonder... came out and went, imagine he came out and went, actually, right, hold the phone. Yeah. Um, but no, Eric Davis, I think, and I think that's a realistic one as well that wouldn't be shocking if it happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Davis, what about you? Have you got like a... I, I like the suggestion of Davis now. I yeah. Just, <laughs> I who, who are you going to say? There, there's a few. I, I didn't have anyone in mind, to be honest, okay. when, I, when I asked you. But Davis, he, he said some things that would be over some people's red lines, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be really curious to hear him testify. And to also testify that, you know, if they asked him about the Wilson documents that are in the congressional yeah. record now, and he could yeah. attest to them being real. Uh, that would be really interesting. Um, might not move the ball for the public, but it would create intrigue that might snowball. Yeah. Um, I I would, though, like someone to come forward who we don't know. Yes. Who, in front of Congress, male, female, indifferent, dino beaver, whatever, <laughs> comes Pencils. forward and says, here's what I, what I was, what I done, what I do. Here's what I work on or worked on and reels off a lot of shit about either biologics, bodies, or craft, and everything would be great. But basically another grush, but someone who's yeah. literally can say, I worked on this. Um, 
I'd love something like that. I still think that's too much of a stretch at the minute. Um, I guess I, I guess Grush could be that cause... guy. Sorry, Dan. Grush could be that guy, but he seems to have held back, doesn't he, from the first time? Because he does have first-hand knowledge. This is exactly what I was going to say. Went, he's not went there. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Grush has, you know, Lou's hinted in, in recent interviews that Grush actually has first-hand knowledge of this stuff, but he didn't go there. So I, I would love someone that was willing to talk about first-hand knowledge and had first-hand knowledge that they could attest to. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not even sure. There, there was some conversation about someone with knowledge of Immaculate. I almost said conception and constellation, yeah. but I'm not sure that I would want to see someone talk about that in this setting yet. Purely I because, would. well, let's discuss our reason. So I, I wouldn't because um, it's it's not necessarily a you know there's a lot of conversation around it, but right now it feels a bit Kona bluish to me, which is that it, it's something that someone found reference to. Uh, the report didn't come from someone who was in it and working on it. Um, so it might not be the mother load that it's being presented as right now. And so I would be worried about wasting that spot and that airtime on something that may or may not be true. And I think it would give a lot of ammo, a lot of easy own goals to for, for skeptics to, to point at. But so, I, yeah, no, no, that's fine. And we'll go into this more on the proper preview show. I think, though... That, for me, ties in, though, with exactly what I've just asked for in terms of someone coming forward and saying, I worked on the craft. Someone to say that I worked on, I was brought pieces of exotic craft and material from recovery operations. It was part of a program called Immaculate Constellation. Um, it's Schellenberger said there was multiple sources. There was the report that was brought to him. That was then corroborated by another source. Corbell said the same thing on Weaponized, um, that they all and i know it's easy for folk who don't like them to go well corbell would come out now and say that and people always get accused of that don't they once a piece of news comes out it would be like us coming out after it we could lie and go yeah we knew about that because pro prove us wrong we did yeah yeah but do you know what i mean you could come out and be like ha yep this is what i've been talking about yeah so a few times when i've mentioned crash retrieval programs it's, it's been this i don't think that is the case with them i would believe corbell and that I've heard this before. I that wouldn't shock me because that's the kind of stuff I believe they would know. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in that. I I think that'll be a part of the hearing, or at least that's what they're trying to make a big part of the hearing. Because I think that's spectacular enough for the UFO community and the public to really get behind. It's, but it's so I, real. I guess so. In a way, we're agreeing. Like I'm worried that it wouldn't be a first-hand witness. But you're saying that if someone is a first-hand witness to Immaculate Constellation, then you'd love to see them testify, which I completely agree with. Um, you know, you're not if they're get a first-hand witness, get, yeah. get them in there. You're not going to get John Q Constellation coming out and going, yes, this was my <laughs> program. I worked on this for, I'll do my accent for this one. I worked on Immaculate Constellation for many decades, recovering many craft of uh, exotic, or, exotic origin. You know, you're not going to get that. But you would get someone who was part of a program that was part of this, like like the Bob Lazar type scenario of I worked on propulsion systems on a craft that was one of nine. I didn't see X, Y, and Z. I just done this. Sure. That's the kind of thing that I would I would think would be a best case scenario. But we will go into that, I think, Dan, in, in more detail when we talk about the overall overall stuff and, and yeah so anyone that's got any thoughts on that send it over via email ufo uap am at gmail.com um and just put hearings or something in the in the line and we can include that stuff on um and yeah even if it's after we release that show send it in anyway we'll include it on the next breakdown and stuff but yeah. we're, we're kind of speeding towards november 13th but i think for a lot of folks listening to this at least 60 percent of you november 5th is probably the date in your mind right now um yeah. So uh, on that, Dan, I don't really have a lot to add on Lou Elizondo's Q&A because the only thing I felt that I saw of note was him hinting at testifying. Um, have you got much much more to add on that? Uh, I'll just scan through my notes here. So yeah. uh, one was that he said 5 uh, to 8% of what he knows is what he can discuss. Um, 
not sure how that figure was arrived at, but I feel like a lot of people want to know the answer to that question. You know, there it is. Um, so there's 90% of what he knows about UAP, even though he's put out there a lot, cannot be discussed, which which I thought was interesting. Um, it came up again about the helicopter, the Italian helicopter. Um, I have a question, sir. On. So with him throwing out that number, do you feel there should have been more in his book that then wasn't there? Yes. But then I don't know, because he always talks about the balancing act, right? That he wanted to stay on the correct line of Dobson so we could actually get this stuff yeah. out. And when we, there, there have been some laughable releases from, you know, FOIA releases where the entire document is blacked out. The book wasn't like that. There were a few moments where it was blacked out and they were kept in, but it wasn't like every page that you were coming to. Yeah. So I think there's a relationship between that where Lou tried to stay within the bounds of the law um, whilst trying to push it a little bit and and a few bits got pinged. Uh, and I so, also yeah. appreciate it. When I ask you that, 90% doesn't mean it's 90% of really fascinating, interesting revelations. Sure. Yeah. There could be a lot of really boring, mundane stuff in that where we would be like, we didn't want to know that. And he'd be like, yeah, but I couldn't tell you that. That's classified, but it's a really boring thing about a sensor system that was used. And you'd be like, well, I don't care about that part of an underwater acoustic microphone that was used to detect this but actually one time it detected this but he'd be like but that's something i knew that i couldn't tell you which would be totally fair um but yeah so uh, the number doesn't necessarily mean to me that he's keeping 90 percent of the secrets from us that yeah although it sure. could be only um, only like 40 percent more could be relevant or interesting yeah 100 yeah our level yeah. of expertise and things like that yeah um yeah sure Sorry, I interrupted. Carry on. It was no, please uh, interrupt as much as you like. Um, there, there was a repeated kind of thing throughout the X space uh, or the Twitter space and and the YouTube Q and A where he kept talking about feeling like he's in a petri dish, and you know it's kind of affectionately called loose clues online uh, that he drops these little hints, and that's something that came up for me. I wrote it down in my notes, like, huh, that's interesting. Um, you know, bacteria was talked about quite a lot in these discussions as well. So that's something, you know, when I get a chance, I'll be I'll be asking him about. Um, he correctly points out that, you know, he, he's asked about um, deception and his job being an intelligence agent. And he points out that he was counter intel, which is different from deception ops, and that people should learn the difference between those two. I thought that was fair. Um, deception. Yeah. <laughs> um, then uh, there was an excellent question about fungi uh, given to Lou in the space as well. Um, Lou kind of says he doesn't really know much about it, but then in another question, he he talks a lot about how the Greeks thought that there were only two major life forms on the planet, humans and animal. And then we actually found that there was a third one and it was kind of the alpha on this planet, which is fungi. You know, it occupies most of the planet. These life forms are huge and go back way way into history you know at some point in the earth's history there were towers of fungi that were bigger than the empire state building which is just you know almost brain breaking to think about a mushroom being that big right shout um, out to the bob hoskins john Leguizamo super mario brothers movie from <laughs> yep. sure it's a good movie fun fact that um, is, um, my little three-year-old boy's favorite mario movie he literally asks and it's available on amazon prime he won't watch the cartoon he will watch the bob hoskins one I, I mean, I agree with him. I, I think that was the better movie, but it might be rose tinted of glasses for me because I, I haven't yeah. seen it in a long time. Yeah. But it knew what it was, right? It knew what it yeah. was, and it didn't have an American Kingdom. pretending to be Italian. And <laughs> No, wait, did it? It did, right? <laughs> Is Bob Hoskins not English? <laughs> yeah, I think so. So I'm correct, but it's yeah. to the wrong yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the fungi thing is interesting. Like we've spoken before about, you know, what if the tic-tac was just fungal and it's kind of some thing that's been created by a life form that we don't think could create something. Uh, trying to get outside the box of thinking about them just being machines from ET. Um, consciousness, death, phenomenon comes up, th those connections about what make us human. Lou's spoken about that a lot, but it always gets me thinking about... You know, we we talk about how oh, the world will come down if disclosure happened, um, and 
some people think it wouldn't and that we'd be fine and you know we point out that the catholic church say you know if god made et they're god's children as well you, you know they're fine they're welcome mm -hmm. but if the, this line of thinking goes down the track of okay so if something if we find something that proves to us that death isn't death and life isn't life and it just makes us think about life as a process because you know our bodies are full of microbes and it, it's a biological process that's what we are and we're just in this form for a while mm -hmm. if a lot of our world kind of revolves around life and death and appreciating life and you know people being sad when death happens and stuff like that they're fairly fundamental things in in the west at least um where we don't think of reincarnation and things like that and I think redefining what life is and what death is, that's the kind of thing that could make people really lose their shit. Um, you know, we, we've seen countless sci-fi movies where people kind of say, well, the scenario is, uh, you know, if there's an afterlife, why don't you just go there right now? Like, if you've had enough of this and there's an afterlife, just go there. It, it would be more pleasant for you. So that kind of thing would happen and people would struggle with that kind of realization that death wasn't death and it didn't yep. stop and that there was a better place to go to right like yep. that would shake the foundations of society mm -hmm. so yeah that that makes me somber thinking about that stuff <laughs> yeah so i thought that was interesting that that came up um klaus tiny klaus from uh, the awesome patents tell stories podcast mm -hmm. he asked lou on a scale of one to ten where humans on the food chain which is a really provocative question right and and lou said in the solar system we might be a nine or a ten but in the wider universe we're probably a one because you know of what what's out there you um just massive amounts of planets like you said about the ocean you can't quite understand how big it is yeah and lou compares uh, he uses that great analogy of there's more stars in the galaxy than there are grains of sand on beaches of earth yeah and all of those stars have planets around them and you know potential life so it's silly to think that we'd be a 10 out there but he he kind of takes a quick aside when he says in the solar system we be, might be a nine or a ten he takes a quick aside to say unless we si find something underwater that's already been here for a while which is interesting right especially considering what we were just talking about with usos and stuff like that could be a hint um trying to find other things oh lou mentioned that he is definitely under surveillance um that he pissed a lot of people off coming out with uap stuff and that they actually when he was doing the story with leslie and ralph from the new york times you know the 2017 one mm -hmm. they actually caught people red-handed and took photos of them uh which i don't think i've ever heard leslie talk about um, I kind of want to see those photos, like out them. <laughs> you, know, the best you mentioned the um, Helene as well. Who Helene, yes, quite right. Helene yeah, quite right. I, I would love to see her talk more. She featured in the series that uh, Leslie did, um, but I'd love to, you know, see her on the interview circuit. And I messaged her a few times, but I've never heard back. She didn't message you back. Nah. No, I, I don't take it personally. Maybe one day. Me back. Yeah. Maybe one day. Um, stuff about lures come up as well, like luring UAP. Um, but we've heard that stuff before. But it, you know, might be huge for people. But yeah, I think I think that was about it in terms of like the big highlights from that for me. Cool, awesome. Um, moving beyond that discussion, Dan. Yeah, nice. Good. Good segue. Um, <laughs> just before we talk about a couple of documentaries coming up, folks, there is no news on James Fox's the program. Other than, other than last week, James had a screening for potential uh, providers of the program on services. I'm guessing he means people from like Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, yeah. whatever it might have been, but all invited to a screening. He said it was really positive. Reactions were fantastic. Could say phenomenal. Um, <laughs> but he's hoping to have something sooner than later. Um, loads of people posting stuff online saying, oh, this platform's got a placeholder saying it's coming out in two weeks nonsense are just placeholders when james announces the date that'll be the date of it and um, so yeah there's nothing on that yet for james fox's the program however uh, beyond a new series from mgm plus debuted on the 27th of october um mgm plus is a streaming service in the us it's not something we get in the uk um even as we record this i've had an email back off the people uh, who i was talking to they have no information yet on international releases. So anyone asking when can we watch it officially outside of the US, uh, there is no information yet if it even will release. I imagine it will. 
it'll pop up on something. Um, but right now, there's no information on it. Um, when I spoke to the two directors um, a couple of days ago, go and check that one out, folks. Really nice guys and um, really refreshing chat with them. They did kind of joke towards the end of it about, you know, in this day and age, there's plenty of ways around these things and, you know, getting to see it online and ha, 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 ha. Not that I'm encouraging folks go use something like a VPN or download it from a torrent website, but, you know, if you can't watch it and they want you to see it, I'm sure it's not going to kill them. However, as best you can, watch it on MGM Plus, of course. I believe MGM Plus is a free trial as well, Dan. So a few folks have said they're going to wait. It's a four-part series which finishes around about the 17th of November. People have said they're going to wait till then, use the free trial, binge watch the four episodes. Um, okay. Just to run through the cast list of some of the folks involved... Dr. Gary Nolan, Leslie Kane, Ryan Graves, Tim Gallaudet, Brian Bender, uh, Representative Adam Schiff, Representative Tim Burchett, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Jacques Vallée, Jeff Kripal, Whitley Strieber, Hal Putov, Chris Mellon, and many more. Um, it's a who's who. Yeah, it very much is a who's who, Dan, yeah. Um, it's a big series. Episode one, just to run through um, some highlights, Dan. Uh, I didn't even know if you'd watched it yet. That's how, um, until we spoke did, before. Yeah. <laughs> um, introduces us at the start getting to know who i'll run through this dan and you can bring in your thoughts uh, getting sure. to know who gary nolan ryan graves and leslie kane are gary nolan talking about havana syndrome early on effects of on the human brain of uap um i've put down a, it was the best animation of the gimbal event i've seen that was very good cgi yes the radar screens and stuff yeah. like that they were really good i have seen people complain though that they don't differentiate when it's artist render or cgi that someone watching from the general public might look and go oh that's a real video they really should have something up to say and i know that might be obvious to people listening to this or us but i get there are some videos in there where it's interspliced where they'll randomly show some ufo footage it would be good for them to differentiate and say artist impression real yeah, footage i agree um, um, Tim Gallaudet talks about seeing the, the email regards the Go Fast video or the Tic Tac shooting across the water. Um, near air misses are reported. Higher ups wanting to know what was going on. He said up to 20 admirals or senior executives sent the email. The next day, Tim said it was wiped from all the computers and others who received it. A story he's told before, but again, good to kind of hear that included on there. Yeah. And uh, talking about him in the hearings. I hope yep. that's not the only story he has to tell no. in the hearings. I hope there's um, more than that. hundred percent. I would be disappointed if Tim Gallaudet turns up and we hear what we've heard before. Um, shows a lot of clips. Some of the clips that were shown, I was a little bit wary though. Um, some of them I'm sure were kind of hoaxy clips that we know of being hoaxy sure. clips. But I think this is an issue we've seen in every UFO documentary almost outside of a James Fox type documentary where researchers will go away and find a load of ufo clips they'll be told get as many as you can we've got a one minute section here where we have leslie kane and gary nolan talking about something we're just going to show some clips over the top of it and producers will just hoy those clips in they won't know if they're quote-unquote genuine or real or credible um so i think that's just a little bit of what happened there um the yeah twin... and oh, go on. So stuff like that as well i always think like, yeah, it sucks that there's hoaxes in there, but we really don't have many genuine videos of UFOs, you know? Yeah. Um, what is then, genuine, that old one? Yeah, and and you, you're you just trying to inspire conversation at this point, yeah. right? Yeah, 100%. So I don't think it's malicious. It's not something that I'd be like, oh, it's crap because they include these. Eh, it's part of the history. Like, we need to talk about it all. Like, I'm not shy about talking about stuff that gets hoaxed in, in the UFO subject. It happens. Yeah. I, I find it fascinating. Yeah. Uh, episode one again continues the 2017 story being explained by Leslie Kane talking about meeting Lou Elizondo, seeing those three videos we all know so well. Uh, Chris Mellon says he sort of auditioned the Washington Post, Politico, and the New York Times to to get the story out there, and those journalists didn't even realize they were sort of auditioning to him. He wanted to see how they would react and deal with it, that it was going to get the biggest reaction and press, and it was going to be treated well. Um, and not just poo pooed and ruined. Um, yeah, there, there was a word used in this part that I found it. It raised my eyebrow because there's been a lot of discussion around were these videos leaked, and yeah. folk like Malin and, and Lou in the past have said they weren't leaked. We got them released officially. We handed them off, so on and so forth. You know, I, I find it. It's almost 
like is it just a shortcut that they use the word leak here or were they actually leaks because there's been yeah. a lot of debate around this online and and a lot of people you know try and buoy it or kind of claim malintent and things like that and i was like huh like leaked were they <laughs> what, what did you think um i'm sure i've heard people like lou elizondo and chris mellon talk enough that they don't like things being leaked because they feel that's a flaw in the system it's a failure it's dangerous so it would be strange to think that they would then go and do that themselves based yeah. on how they feel about that sort of process being done unless they had good reason to do it um i've always been under the impression that there was a bit of a gray area around how they got those out but hey ho it's the ufo topic isn't it so all about the yeah. grays um so I, guess, yeah. I guess maybe just like a shortcut in terms uh interestingly i i posted a, a poll on my social media last week kind of saying to people uh what what do you want from ufo videos that are coming out in the future do you want leaks that you know essentially may not have a chain of custody you won't be able to discern you know the real from the fake so on and so forth mm -hmm. or or do you want official government transparency and for all the crap they'll give us, you know, like Arrow doing? Um, are you okay with that in the name of them just talking about it more? And it was a close one. 47% wanted leaks and 53% wanted official government transparency. So, uh, yeah, where do you stand on that? Um, I would... I'm quite happy to see anything and have a look at it, but I get the issues with that. But I also get the issues with the official quote unquote government videos because if these are the gatekeepers and the secret keepers, does this not go back to what we're saying? It's a really hard one because are they then giving you what they want you to see? Gimbal exactly. tic go fast could be exactly that as well. Yeah. And and it goes way back, you know, the Air Force in the fifties, they they would always say, like we we unless you know what you're looking for, it's like FOIA. Unless you know what you're looking for, they're not going to volunteer information. So yeah. there could be a hundred sightings of UFOs in one day. And if you only hear about the one in New York and you bring it up with them, they're just going to go, yes, there was a UFO sighting in New York. And they won't give you anything they already know that you already don't already know. Sorry, <laughs> my fault. I've got some more notes, Dan, but I'm going to bring up my main talking point from this episode, right? Um, and folks, generally the episode is, I think if you're really well versed in the UFO topic, it won't be anything new. However, largely the comments that aren't degraded and that it's the same old, same old, et cetera, et cetera, right? People are entitled to that. As it looks good, it looks nice, it's well put together. You might not necessarily learn anything new, but I think it's another good entry point for folks who are new to the subject. Um, yeah. And it does cram a lot of information in. However, the one thing that really stood out to me and I could be nitpicking this over nothing. Leslie Kane calls ATIP a Pentagon group and not a program. For me, that's a little bit of a walk back in the language of ATIP being an official program, which is how it was always put forward. And there's been these murmurings and talk that ATIP, ATIP was a thing. I think I'm, I don't need to say that at this point. Okay. However, a lot of the chat around Lou Elizondo's book and other folks coming forward has been, especially with the Jay Stratton stuff and wherever that's going to go, ATIP wasn't as official as was made out. We've talked about that before and that not, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I just thought it was interesting to hear Leslie Kane call ATIP a Pentagon group because I've never really heard her use that before and that might just be me. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely on the money there. I've got a note here that she, she said ATIP was a small operation in the Pentagon um as opposed to you know this this big well-funded yeah. thing and she even goes into them not having funding and stuff and we've heard a lot of that stuff you know in Lou's book and yeah. stuff like that our discussion of this goes goes way back um sorry i just knocked my desk um and like it, it's just it's one of these points of contention between so many groups in the ufo subject isn't it mm -hmm. where they say it's not an official program um and some people say it was and so on and so forth I'm sure the people in it working it day to day, if they had an office and, you know, they, they were all in the same office every day working together, um, it was a program. But then does that justify the official way they use the word program in the Pentagon? Maybe not. You know, Tim, mm -hmm. Tim McMillan talks about how every program begins is a working group where you kind of do yep. it um, 
whilst doing other roles you do it and then you kind of snowball it right and then it becomes a big program once you can justify it so maybe it was something like that but you're you're spot on to point that out with with leslie um you know the the initial article presented it as this really well established well formed thing um whereas this is a bit of a language change and again i wonder oh. if it's a shortcut or yeah. i wonder if is it's that a mean, you know yeah and that's not me sounding sneaky or suspicious about lou and atip and all that as it, it was a means to an end to get the story out there in a way that they maybe had to oversell certain aspects of it to make it sound more official than it was but it doesn't take away from the work it was doing and i think Speaking to Sarah Gam, I know folks about a lot of folks will have listened to that. If you haven't, go and check it out, folks. Because um, even if you don't listen to it, just put it on mute and let it play. That would be great. Um, but Sarah Gam talks about working with the UAP task force. How some of that work was literally a chat room they would use, sure. and I'm not talking AOL or MSN. You know, it's an official DoD chat room, but it would be UFO stuff, and there would be folders, and you would look at the folder. And random folks pop in the chat room and, oh, have you seen this video? Yeah, let's have a look at that. And they would discuss it, use their expertise and kind of work out what stuff was or wasn't. And that was how the UAP task force stuff for her came around. She was involved in a chat room looking at UFO stuff within DOD. Now, does that mean that's not official? You could look at that in any way, shape or form. Because I even asked her, but were you being paid to do that? Technically, she wasn't. That was just something she was doing as an aside, an offshoot of her role. But she's she's on the clock. She's working. She could do that as part of her job because she's helping out whatever it may be. So um, it, I it think makes me you... think of... Sorry to jump in. No, no, no. I, I was just going to you, you know, when uh, it came out that Travis Taylor was the chief scientist of the UAPTF, is, is he? Like, were there other scientists there what, that had just as much authority in doing that work as he did yep. and maybe he feels that he just did a lion's share of the work so the way to instead of telling everyone about chat rooms and explaining how ah, this cell government work begins and blah 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 he's just like no i was like basically the chief scientist of this whole thing yeah like is it just kind, kind of what we were saying earlier with you know lose five to eight percent kind of comment and that some of that is just going to be uninteresting to us maybe that's one of the things that is just uninteresting to hear yeah. about like all the no you can only call it a program if it does x y and z and you're paid to do it and blah 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 yeah you exactly know? um so 23 minutes into the episode uh we start to hear about the 2023 hearings with david grush uh chris Selen chris mellon says it was the pilots who made the difference and made people in the halls of power take notice uh graves and fravor sharing the experiences with these people face to face um i've made a note dan i like that we're halfway through the first episode it's covered a lot of ground from 2017 mm -hmm. to 2023 already it's bringing people right up to date very quickly it's not laboring the point and really dragging it out it's not a full episode of the hearings from 2023 by the end of the episode when it crash retrievals a focus on the language being used and how powerful that is for the public and then proper like you know if you talk about the tic tac doing a 90 degree turn whitley streber pops up on the screen and it's experiencers and that kind of leads yep. us into the second episode um i've seen the first three dan i've not seen the fourth um it kind of takes you through the and i talked about this with the the director sorry um you see more about the experiencers in the second episode third episodes about no, and um also the history of the topic in the second episode you see about the cover-up the air force the third episode's a bit of a mishmash the fourth i've not seen but they go into remote viewing etc as part of it as well um which will be interesting to see how all all that's covered and who comes in at that point too um, nice. and there are no details like i say for international screenings or viewings of yet yeah i went uh online and just tried to drag out the the episode summaries of two three and four and and two like you know it, it's exactly what you said episode two the, the summary is most people think that ufos are just machines in the sky but legendary researcher jack valet and writer whitley schreiber believe that the explanation is much stranger and more terrifying a terror that schreiber has experienced firsthand so it's really good to see them getting into experiences you know it's it's almost getting getting the really dry stuff the government stuff out of the way in the first episode really fast so that we can go okay so what are they let's explore this idea yeah. um and and i think that's been a criticism of a lot of series in the past where it just kind of drags out all of that stuff 
as interesting as it is, some people just don't find it like the world on fire. Yeah. Then, yeah, episode three, uh, academics and scientists are finally able to study UFOs and alien encounters without risking their careers. Some subjects remain taboo, though, including materials allegedly left by UFOs and the frightening stories of experiences. So going deeper, like you said, in episode four, um, the summary was a number of mavericks believe that unexplained phenomena like remote viewing and near-death experiences have a strange connection to UFOs. And this connection threatens to change everything we thought we knew about human consciousness. So that's kind of getting into, I guess, what we call the woo, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm really curious to, to see what the reception to that episode in particular is like, because that's that's past the red line for a lot of people. You know, we, mm. we hear people say, why are we talking about abductions a lot? Because it kind of just, if you're into UFOs, you, you come across abductions. But remote viewing, near-death experiences, consciousness, they're bigger subjects, bigger implications, and yeah, more, more woo for, for people. And good timing that it's it's going to be the four four parts uh, dropping weekly through to the seventeenth of November, and you've got those hearings right before the yep. last episode as well. So I imagine really good timing for you know that kind of stuff, just for search engines, algorithms, people paying attention to it online. That'll get a little jump and spike. So uh, I'm sure they'll be pretty happy with that. Um, yeah. We, we also have the the 20th anniversary of the Nimitz encounter, the Tic Tac encounter, on the 14th of November. Crazy to think it's been 20 years since that's happened. Mm, absolutely. Um, and the week, uh, week or, yeah, week before that, um, another documentary coming out, Dan. Not a whole lot to go on this one at the minute. It's Investigation Alien, uh, George Knapp's Netflix documentary. I believe oh, yeah. it's a, a 10 part series. Um, I think. If you're in the UFO community, and I've got a lot of respect for George Knapp. I like George. Um, I think this will give you more, more depth. And if you look, if you're looking for quote unquote new stuff, I think this will be the one you're going to see some newer stuff. Because I think that's what a George Knapp will bring to the table. This will be a little bit more, the bit more nuanced to it. Um, it seems to have a whistleblower involved. I believe there's footage in it from the US Navy. So you'll probably see some kind of new footage within it as well. Yep. And I think that's what you're going to get from a Nat or a James Fox, as opposed to a big mainstream series picking up the UFO topic to present it to a public audience. Um, there's also, it was mentioned in the kind of conversation around it. And I think it was hinted at in the trailer as well. Uh, in the series, George visits a place called uh, Tampico in Mexico, which was on my list to, to visit. Um, when I was there, because the people of the town, I use that broadly, might not be everyone, might just be a few, um, believe that basically they're protected from hurricanes on that coast. They kind of, it, it's on the east coast of Mexico, kind of facing into where the, the horrific hurricanes that just happened or, or formed. Um, they face into that way. So they should get a lot of hurricanes, but they they say that they're protected by an ET base. So that intrigued me because it's not really well known. It's been reported on, but it's not really well known. So it's interesting that George is choosing to put that in there. Like you said, it's it's something new, something that a lot of people in the community might not be familiar with. So as well as video, as well as a new whistleblower, you're also probably going to learn a little bit about things that, you know, whether you, you dig them or not, it, it's different couple of things i don't know if you got a chance to to listen or watch weaponized dan uh from last week when it was on i did not know uh, i had an eye appointment that day and literally was blind for about two or three hours due to drops they put in my eye so i oh, no. i put it on uh on my, my phone and i couldn't even see my phone screen but i made notes uh, trying to dictate the notes uh, on my uh, just I had nothing to do for like an hour or so. Um, they talked a little bit about the series. Um, I think this will be one for the UFO community, but newbies will love it as well. It'll look really good. It's a Netflix documentary. Nap knows what he's doing. On on the weaponized episode, though, Corbell was talking about his interaction with whistleblowers. Said he's had to speak to law enforcement because he's been threatened for those conversations. He gets why things are getting to kind of fever pitch and a boiling point just now. Um, interestingly, he says the hearing that was meant to happen in September was delayed because there was far too much going on. And we had heard there was going to be a hearing in September, then one in November. 
But he said the September hearing, it just made sense. Everything was too busy, not just from a UFO point of view, but politically on the world stage, the election stuff was getting to a fever pitch as well. Um, and it just made sense. So it was pushed back. They talk about the, the term ARV, so alien reproduction vehicle. Um, alien reproduction vehicle, Dan, is basically humans have back engineered it and we have something that we've managed to use their tech to have now a black triangle or some kind of funky, yeah, funky craft that we have created from the recovered technology. And they're basically talking about Greer. And and that basically says sometimes horrible people get good info. Um, is it disinformation? Is it BS? Unsure, but not to worry too much about reports coming out or people using the term ARV if you associate it with something or someone else because it doesn't always... And do you know what? To be fair, we have said as much with Greer. Um, just because people have an opinion of him now doesn't mean at one point he may not have had really good intentions, really good sources, really good information. He could still have some really good sources now, just the way it's presented and, and put forward. We don't sure. know. Um, so, yeah, they discussed uh, that, which was really fair. To Nap's point there as well, one of the first uh, the defence intelligence research uh, papers that came out of OSAP, the, the dudes, one of the first releases of those came from Corey Good, who, you know, if you if you follow the subject, Corey Good is very controversial uh, mm -hmm. because everyone thought that he was just making stuff up. He had these claims of 20 and back, the program was called, where you'd give 20 years of your life to go fight in space wars against the aliens, and then they'd put you back in your body 20 years ago, and you'd be able to live out the time that you missed, and so on and so forth. He actually ended up in a deposition, deposition through a lawsuit where he admitted that he, he'd made all this up. It was his imagination. But he still got that dude first, and he published it first. So someone yeah. gave it to him. It's yeah. almost plausible deniability to give it to someone like that, right? Yeah. Um, the the sounds like the whistleblower who came out about Immaculate Constellation will potentially be speaking at the hearings. That's kind of hinted at. Uh, Corbell's very quick to say this was all done legally as well. They've been very careful with it. The people involved in this, Schellenberger done his, his due diligence with the articles. There's more than one person involved in this story. The Immaculate Constellation stuff, according to, to Corbell and that, and Schellenberger, who, who broke the, the story, isn't one person coming out. It's multiple sure. people corroborating a story, a program, and and Jeremy's always positive anyway, isn't he? But he seems very, very excited about the potential this could have. But he also says this is why a lot in the IC, the intelligence community, are getting squeamish and a bit squirmy in their chairs, Dan, um, which wouldn't be a totally unfair thing to think at this point, would it? No, not at all. Um, you know, Immaculate Constellation, if it is what has been insinuated, then there are masses of data in that program and its sister programs, because it you know, wouldn't just be one. Um, there'd be other ones that are kind of dedicated to different parts of, of UFOs or UAP. Um, yeah, just masses of data that you know 4k footage we heard you know taken from incredibly sophisticated platforms so yeah let, let's get this rolling if they know that that data is there then i'm sure a bunch of the senators will want to see one or two videos from there right at the very yeah. least 100 percent. and before we move on to listener questions dan uh, we're an hour and 23 minutes in so listener questions to go still uh anything we've missed off you want to bring up uh so one uh congratulations to david marla and everyone that's been working with him at the national ufo historical record center they recently opened their new facility in rio rancho new mexico um, it, is, everything, yep. <laughs> it, it is uh america's most extensive collection of original historical documents related to ufos like you can go there and you can see original blue book reports original a testimony you can listen to it um pretty much any any case you can think of will have the original reports there so i i very much imagine that the u.s government will be speaking to david and will want to work together but it is an independent archive it's a non not-for-profit uh thing that's kind of working with the the school system in rio rancho which is great because obviously you know, imagine imagine that instead of going to see dinosaurs in school for a, a day trip to a museum, you go to the National UFO Historical Records Center. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool, right? Um, it's going to inspire people to get involved. Uh, you can go see it. It is open to everyone. You just have to register on their website, which is nufohrc.org. Bit of a mouthful. 
but uh, just if you if you Google National UFO Historical Record Center, it will take you to that website. And then whilst I'm on the subject of national archives and records and things like that, there was a bit of a hoo-ha this past couple of weeks with, um, according to the 2024 NDAA, uh, it required that by October 20th, 2024, and I quote, each head of a government office shall review, identify, and organize each unidentified anomalous phenomena record in its custody for disclosure to the public and transmission for the National Archives. And the American National Archives is where you can go look at this stuff, and they've been digitizing yeah. a lot of their historical stuff, so you can look at it online. However, on October 10th, um, the NARA issued a memo, that's the National Archives, um, basically saying that the transfer of publicly releasable UAP records to federal um, agency records officers requesting that uh, agencies transfer this stuff as soon as possible or no later than September 30th, 2025. So the date is shifted by a year to get this stuff out. And I, I thought it was worth talking about because it's one of these things where the language and the wiggle room in this stuff is really interesting. The law says that they had to review, identify, and organize their stuff. They di It did not say they had to transfer it. The recent memo tells them that they've got to transfer it by September 30th next year. So whether they're moving the goalpost to say to give people another year or whether they're closing a loophole there um, remains, you know, you, you can argue over it till you blue in the face. But the point is that uh, the it's called Reco Group 615. That's where the new stuff that all of these agencies like the Air Force, the NSA, everyone like that, if they've got anything UAP in their records that they haven't fessed up to having, they have to hand it over by September 30th, 2025. And it will be held in Record Group 615. So you be able to go online to the National Archives in the USA and, and look at that stuff. There will also be summaries put up of stuff as they receive it before they digitize it. So you'll be able to kind of know the Air Force sent us 500 videos or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to address that because I, I know there was some uh, some anger, <laughs> I guess is the word, about them moving the date to September 30th. And on that technicality, being required to review, identify, and organize, but not told to transfer. Technically, they didn't do anything illegal, but the loophole, if it was one, is now closed. And by September 30th next year, we should see that stuff in the National Archives. I suppose worth mentioning then the Global Disclosure Day from the New Paradigm Institute. Did you catch yes. any of the live stream, Dan? Um, a little bit. Um, it, it was very fast. It was about a two-hour event with 20-odd speakers. So, yeah. Ended up over three hours three hours 20 for the oh did it three, i don't know if you bad. watched if you watched the live one dan or if you watched the one afterwards that they chopped up um but the live stream was like three hours it went over um it was busy and i had kevin Wright on discussing it right after it fair play to him jim garrison on before it um and yeah i think there's there's an idea there that is worth looking at on what they are hoping to do on an annual basis um I made the point to Kevin that it just needs probably formed a little bit more. Um, it was put together with like five weeks notice. So well done on that front. Um, and you know, I felt so bad. I mentioned the the AI music that was part of it, which I felt was really out of place. Again, a lot of people commented on the mu one was like a rock music video or something that was put in. I think Ron James, I think it was, put a trailer on about disclosure or it was something like that and it just didn't fit it didn't fit and there was an ai piece of music that someone had put together just one of the the guys involved in one of the groups and i was just like it's a bit cheesy and out of place again and i'm just coming from a point of view of if you're trying to sell a real serious disclosure discussion thinking of members of the public watching it if you've got folk in the ufo community unhappy about an aspect of it the public's probably going to reflect that as well. Um, and the yeah, guy who made fair. the music yeah, commented to me on YouTube. Um, <laughs> and he was like, everyone hates the song, ha. Huh? And I was, I was like, look, it, it's not bad. It's AI music. Um, and I get what the, it was coming from a good place, but I just think certain things is like a time and a place. Um, yeah. And what they were trying to put together, it just broke up certain aspects of it as well. Um but in terms of, I think, 
if what I took away from it as an event was there's a grassroots movement across multiple states um, with these local chapters like Albuquerque and, and various places. They had um, Ryan from Hong Kong, um, Stan Ho on, who's doing work out in Hong Kong as well, who's hopefully coming on the podcast soon. Um, and these people have got local Citizens for Disclosure groups. And I was like, that's great. Get folks involved, actually involved in the topic, because um, that's, that's a really good thing. Um, and I get you need the big names talking to get people going to watch it. But I'd like to see if anything comes of it that that is the the main thing. So, well done to them yeah. putting it on at short notice. The, there's a I, I, there's the seed of an idea there. I, I think there's something to be said for, and I've seen a lot of criticism of just the title of the day as well, Disclosure Day, because it it kind of gives the impression that you're disclosing that this is the day where you know we're going to show you the evidence finally, and yep. you know I don't think that was ever on the table from and the people kind of promote it and stuff like that you know it was just a conversation to bring anyone everyone together from around the world and and show it people places it's a worldwide a new thing AP, isn't it it's about new yeah AP and... I, I guess you know uap day or something like that you know there's a ufo day every year you, you could definitely kind of do something like that um uap but... global discussion day yeah something yeah. like that you, you know and it's it's a bit more upfront about what it is you know you, you can't call something a free pizza party and then not get give people free pizza they get mad about it so i think it's worth kind of you know maybe maybe having to think about what the title is not that they'll listen to me but you know like you say props you know they put it together in five weeks yeah. so respect there and we do need more stuff like this the the one thing that did jump out to me from it was uh you know we saw colonel carl nell speaking uh for the first time since the salt conference mm -hmm. uh sorry the salt talk that he did um which was awesome so this is the third time he's kind of spoken out and in this one um he specifically says that he is a first-hand witness to some of this stuff uh, i know this firsthand and uh, he says and so i want to see him talk you know may maybe he'd be good to to have testify if that's the case 100 um, percent. yeah but first-hand witness seems to know a lot heavy hitter had access to a lot of secrets for the US government. He's very trusted, very well respected, very decorated. Let's get him in the hearings. Yeah. Yeah, he would not be a bad I wouldn't be disappointed if Nell turned up. Yeah, same. Would not be disappointed. Um listener questions then. Let's go. Rattle through some of these to, to round off, which is probably going to approach two hours. Um, I hope the first one is how are you? <laughs> The first one, so the first one have I, I've not proofread them again, folks. I, I tend not to do that. Do I? <laughs> um, I would like to know the Andy slash Dan view, and we might have covered this, on the supposed evidence of NHI found nearby in a nearby star system, artificial radio signal from 2019, and or artificial light detected on the same planet, allegedly. That was from Ken. So hi, Ken. Um, I think we kind of covered that one earlier, Dan, but just to, just to recap on that whole supposed evidence found in nearby star systems radio signals whatnot oh sorry i thought i thought you were going to talk on it no no <laughs> giving you space um yeah uh the signal bcl1 it was thought to be anomalous in some way so scientists uh, are going through it trying to check it and, and kind of scratch off the possible prosaic explanations um in recent weeks it's been pushed by uh, simon holland in various outlets um, a, a YouTuber who, you know, Fidus, he, he has a good pedigree kind of working with um, Horizons, a, a really good BBC program where they produced really reputable documentaries kind of founded on good information and stuff like that. Um, but to, to the claims that, you know, something's definitely going to be announced based on BC, the BCL1 signal, I actually managed through a colleague, uh, Ross, from... Uh, event horizons on on youtube a uh, really great channel very science-based uh, they always talk to astronomers and stuff like that they actually happen to know the director of breakthrough listen dr andrew simon simon sorry and they got in touch with him and just asked him directly is there anything to this his response was that the story was untrue and uh sorry the story was nonsense and not at all true that was the that was the sentence that was said so he could be hiding something if you want to go there and kind of play it that way. He could be downplaying it. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been fooled by the very director of the project that was said to to be saying that it was going to happen. Um, 
And then that gets conflated with the other things like it finding lights in star systems and so on and so forth. Pretty much what we said earlier. This stuff yeah. gets conflated and trotted out time and time again. Uh, it's it's never going to be aliens until it is aliens. Uh, so just wait for the experts, I guess. <laughs> Mantis people. Um, Mantis people. Goodbye Blue had a couple of questions. The first one we answered because it was, uh, what are your thoughts on Danny Sheehan's recent interviews on the Julian Dory podcast? The first one was on the mountain bases and stuff and we talked about that. And um, mm -hmm. the second part is um, the somewhat confusing stance between saying that the UAPDA is essential to get past, but also seeming to question the intentions of elements of the intelligence community for suddenly being more forthcoming. I'm struggling to formulate my question clearly, but I just feel there's a contradiction there. And perhaps it's simply down to the fact that every person that is deeply involved in this has their own perspective and set of connections and therefore insight into what's really going on and ultimately whether there is controlled disclosure as a controlled disclosure happening and who is in fact pulling the strings to make it happen above the public people we all know about. Um, so yeah, I hadn't seen that particular quote, but uh, goodbye Blue saying that, you know, the, there was a stance so UAP disclosure that's essential but there's an element around being sus or as the kids would say or suspicious about the intelligence community being more forthcoming all of a sudden it's a hard one isn't it and this is something I spoke to uh, a few folks about who who question like Dahlia for example on the listener call in from Chickenlandia hello Dahlia really distrusting of anyone to do with the CIA, especially because of our heritage and background and what the CIA has done and what it stands for. And then I use the example of, well, what about a Jim Semivan when he's doing this work? Is it just a blanket distrust? Or is that not potentially someone, a person, working for a historically distrustful organization? People know what the CIA has done, aspects of it anyway, over the decades. It's not done a lot of nice things um, to its own people even. But is that a fair point then, Dan? Yeah, that there's, and I think me and you, everyone, we, we do this as well, to be fair. You will criticize one aspect of, or critique one aspect of the UFO topic or an, an element of it. But then on the other hand, we'll talk positively about something because it suits a narrative and opinion and agenda. And it's, it's very difficult to not do in this, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And we always say you've got to try and separate all these claims out from people you know because a person makes a claim it doesn't mean the cia is making a claim or because the cia office released a statement it doesn't mean that everyone in the cia agrees with that statement uh these organizations are made up of individuals who have their own ideas and opinions about uh what has been done uh jim it's funny you mentioned jim for, for me uh i feel like jim could be a little more transparent and you get a bit more trust because when he's asked about what the CIA did in the past and, you know, some of the lesser stuff that they've been involved in. He just flat out denies it, um, most of it anyway, and suggests that there's no way they could be doing that in the modern day. I get it. As as an employee of that organization, um, that you have to kind of toe the line there. But at the same time, I think being open to the possibility that that could be wrong uh, would, would go a long way for him. Uh, the quote that the listener is talking about is, I brought her up earlier, um, where Danny kind of alludes that, oh, yeah, suddenly after all this movement, there mm. are government officials coming forward going, oh, no, yeah, we, we want to talk now. We feel bad about <laughs> what we've been doing behind closed doors, and we swear we'll tell you everything. But then again, they're saying, well, we're not going to reveal everything. We're just going to reveal some of what we know. There's some stuff that we really can't reveal what those are. And I agree. You know, it, it's I, I think we have to remember that these people took an oath to their country and not to us. They're not out to break their oath and to go to jail over it and stuff like that. But they do seem to genuinely want this conversation to start happening with the public. Yeah. Um, but not give us everything because we don't have that, you know, there's the three magic words there, right? That we don't have the need to know. Yeah. Um hats it to Ross and I, Bryce over there. <laughs> I, I bet if we sat in the room and I've said something similar before, Dan, but if you got to sit with one of these really high ranking CIA guys who knew loads of stuff to do with the ufo topic and they said okay we're for a minute just me and you dan going to sit down in this room and i'm going to tell you what i know and you'd be like yeah yeah go for it i bet there would be elements of what they would say that you would go ah i wish he hadn't told me that i'd yeah. rather i'd rather forget that and not know that yeah absolutely you know even down to um I spoke to someone before who for the uk they're the person who sits kind of by the red button 
and it would have been their job that if any country fired nukes at the UK, it would have been their job to get in touch with the prime minister to be told to press that red button. And he said, in in a kind of run of conversation, I was like, "This how how close how close have you come to having to do that?" And he said, I can't go into specifics, but it gets close more than you'd comfortably like to know. And I, I think that is exactly what we're saying, right? God help anyone phoning Keir Starmer to do that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, it speaks to essentially what we're getting at here. That yeah. There are just things that, you know, it, it would keep some people up at night. To know that potentially every day that if they said oh yeah 10 times a day we almost press that red button uh you'd be worrying every day about it then like is it now is it now is it now um yeah. there are people who would obsess over it dan next question is we're going to pause for a second for it the listeners won't know because i need you won't have i guarantee you won't have watched it i haven't either but i've just managed to find the thing uh, cosmo <laughs> cosmo warrior said thoughts on the brackets yawn Battle for Disclosure documentary with Stephen Greer, Billy Carson, etc. I've not seen the trailer. Um, what I'm going to do, Dan, is pause this now. And we're going to come back and discuss the trailer, right? Okay, sure. Okay, we have literally just spent the minute and 38 seconds watching the trailer. Not discussed it. I just asked Dan, are you done? He said yes. Okay, so um, Dan, we've got a trailer there. Uh, Stephen Greer, Billy Carson... Um, Tim Burchett, Sean Ryan, who right now has one of the biggest podcasts on the planet, uh, is there commenting. Michael Herrera, who uh, the guys in the Discord chat will love to see. Um, so, brand new witnesses is something that's said really early on there. Okay, and all I'm all I'm thinking, and I'm trying not to be negative about this, is at a time where we have congressional hearings. Um, genuine whistleblowers coming out, and this isn't a dig at any of these former military personnel that are on here. Would you go through a documentary like this? It's called Battle for Disclosure, folks, right? Um, and give away that kind of information when you could do it on on the public stage. I I don't know. Um, it looks like yeah. what I thought that trailer would look like before I um watched it. Not yeah, much. I mean we we spoke earlier about disclosure day and you know reading the room and being aware of your audiences yeah. and kind of aiming properly and and the Star Wars effects in this just immediately you know they they make me want to switch off. I didn't. I watched the whole thing. Um the actual information that they're talking about in the trailer, you know, projects run illegally, um using security as a cover, that kind of stuff. Yeah, cool, fine. That that's all kind of in line with what we've heard. But to your point, there, there's a bit in the trailer where Greer points out Congress didn't have the precise info. Uh, I mean, we've been told that they were given the precise info, but at the same time, if you're criticizing Congress for not having that precise info, but then you're only keeping these new witnesses in for your documentary, it's it's kind of like there's a tension there. But they are, you should they are, be pushing those witnesses to Congress if you think that Congress needs to be shown the precise info. Right. There, There's my main issue, though, with Greer and folks like this. And again, I would still love to have Stephen Greer on for a conversation, but I don't think he would bother. Um, he wouldn't want to. He doesn't owe me anything. Probably doesn't know, me, know who I am. But that's, Stephen, that's Greer, crazy, yeah. <laughs> Stephen Greer seems to have this thing of, they're all wrong, but I'm not. They don't know. They have, there's, they're there's getting the wrong information. I've got the right information, though. That really frustrates me with Stephen Greer. And that's the way he comes across in this again. It's that whole, I know the full story. I know all the truth. You all don't, but I'm going to help you get there. Don't listen to anybody else except me. That frustrates me. There's an element of ego that comes across that I can I find really off-putting. Um, however, Dan, it's available on the... 10th of december across multiple platforms including prime video um all that kind of stuff um dan i will pay for us both to watch that and we can record a bonus episode we won't we won't send that on the free feeds because i think that might be more of a discussion for behind a paywall folks um not that you're going to miss out on anything groundbreaking i don't think but 
let's keep that as I a know that show. that monolith story sound like I I want to see the monolith story and and this is the thing right for for all of for all of the ego that seems to come with Gria's stuff there are people who are trying to present stories yep. and to whether whether you dig into them and you find out that they're fake or nonsense or whatever you have to take in the information and give it the time of day otherwise you're falling victim to your bias you know we often talk yep. about me with bob lazar like yeah sure based on the evidence that i've read um i lean towards a negative with bob but I'll never not listen to something that he says because that would be me falling victim to my bias and I could miss out on a piece of information that completely tips my opinion on its head. So you you kind of, you know, it's hard because there's a lot of information in this field and it's hard to pass. But when it's yeah. packaged like this and it's just like, eh, you know, I, I grew up watching UFO documentaries. I'm into this stuff. Then yeah. I'm, I'm going to give it the time of day on the off chance that there is a small nugget. Even if there's two seconds of something amazing and genuine in there, it would be worth my time. Um, but I do wish they'd stop, drop the uh, drop the Star Wars font and, and stop just the mudslinging, you, you know, yeah. be constructive, help, help the subject. Six or seven years ago or 10 years ago, I'd, I would have watched that and been like, oh, this is so cool. Um, and maybe a little bit more airing of that the wary of that stuff now but we'll watch it dan and we'll, we'll chat about it um at the time we'll, we'll give it a fair go um so I, yeah i will also say just before you get to the next question that that last quote in the trailer i i my eyes roll back into my heart into my head as what hard as possible quote? when the guy said this is the most secret shit you've ever heard of oh. government agents don't talk like that <laughs> i know enough by this point to know that it's just not but again that guy might be full of bullshit and there might be 10 others in the documentary who are presenting but, amazing does that not stories say he's like a, a former sergeant uh i think he did at the bottom yeah. so just I, I don't have an issue with that. that just could just be normal guy speak that's just somebody who's really nervous it's like just maybe but it just comes off to me as like if i well, ran up to you and i had you know black shades on and i was like i'm going to tell you the most secret shit you've ever heard of <laughs> like just run in the other direction flip side of that i suppose just purely because i'd finished a youtube video earlier the john oliver ufo video came on from the daily, is oh, it sure. daily show yeah no uh daily show. no it's just uh last week john oliver. John oliver. Yeah, yeah and he he's he never he joked and laughed about he found it really odd that a pilot would say oh my gosh when talking about the that is true video. and sure. he was like pilots don't talk like that because he said he would say something like jesus back flipping christ or something like that you know <laughs> sure like, yeah I remember saw that. That. so yeah let's let's be fair call us but yeah so um interesting we'll we'll watch that dan in december yeah in, we'll give it a fair share the christmas bonus episode for people to yeah why not to enjoy <laughs> Um, Peter says, hi Peter, uh, in the recent pods with Sarah Gam and Stephen Brown, uh, the conversation very much drifted away from the nuts and bolts, flying saucers, and crash retrievals towards more esoteric subjects, such as the role of consciousness and spirituality in the phenomenon. Sarah is, for example, not only an astrophysicist, but also a Reiki master. Also, Lou Elizondo would appear to be the epitome of a nuts and bolts investigator looking at actual threats has also admitted to being deeply religious, capable of remote viewing, and plagued by glowing orbs in his home. Quite funny when you read it like that. Do you both detect a shift in the current narrative from all parties involved, away from physical flying saucers to the very nature of reality itself? And is this the reason why disclosure is being so strenuously resisted? Dan? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's an interesting question. For, for me, I, I've always been into the woo side of stuff. So whilst I acknowledge that the main conversations are starting to widen a little bit to include stuff like remote viewing and orbs and, you know, things like that, for me, it, it's always been there. And it's something that every year in the conversation, it, the aperture almost widens to a include a little bit more woo. So this kind of stuff is is stuff that I've been, you know, looking at and reading about and, and listening to interviews uh, with, with various people about for a long while. So it's not as jarring for me. But every time I hear it, I, I do wonder what people outside this subject think about that kind of stuff. Because, you know, when, when Sarah Gam came forward, a big deal was made out of her spirituality and, and that kind of angle. Uh, by Stephen Greenstreet, and he tried to use it to discredit her. 
but obviously if you're into these more esoteric things it's not as necessarily discrediting as uh, someone like Stephen would have thought. But at the same time, there are people out there that would find that discrediting. And I mean, personally, as someone that loves this woo stuff, um, I'm, I'm encouraged that it's kind of being brought into the conversation because consciousness and spirituality, it, it kind of gets at the same stuff using different language. You know, we we say religion. Religion is just something that science hasn't defined yet that is supernatural that is accepted we, we you know we just call that religion and <laughs> we worship a guy in the sky or whatever and yeah it's fine now because it's religion it, it's not something kooky um but then you talk about spirituality or if i said to you uh thin in the veil if i said to you the veil's getting thinner you know your eyes will probably roll in the back of your head but then all the person could mean by that is that more people are discussing it than ever and therefore the woo is becoming normalized <laughs> so there there are phrases and ways of talking about these things with language that isn't so full of woo and i feel like we're trying to push in that direction yeah i think the worry for a lot of folks is it's like a game of pass the parcel dan and you feel you're getting close to the prize at the bottom you know you can start to hear something shake and rattle but we're going to unwrap the last thing nothing's there and somebody brings in a new prize for us to start again on and it's just like that's <laughs> a never-ending cycle. Um, but it, it does seem that people are getting more open to those conversations. They're at least happening. Um, I'm trying to be more more open with them. But I think that's why when I spoke to Sarah Gam, I tried to format because there was so much to put in. But I tried to make it that the first half was more nuts and boltsy, and then move into the let's go back and look at the spiritual stuff and try and weave it back in because. I think otherwise it can be too jarring for a lot of folks to be like near death. Oh, you worked at the task force. Oh, you started seeing entities. Oh, then you, you saw essentially you saw dead people. Oh, okay, your medium ship. You contacted blue aliens. There's a way to kind of have that that people are just like nah, like tap out. But I agree there is a conversation there worth having because it's too easy to outright dismiss it because there are plenty of folks who. If you look at the first half of me talking to Sarah being nuts and bolts, the second half being woo, there are people who would much rather hear the woo and they think the nuts and bolts stuff's bullshit. So there are there are people on both sides. Um so you've got to kind of pay them pay them both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there there was a in Lou's X space, um, he he referenced Jim Lakatsky and how Jim or uh, well, Lou's words were it would be unwise to suggest UAP are purely physical. That's a really woo statement. He said yeah. it in a really nuts and bolts way, but it's a really woo statement. And he cited Lekatsky and and what, you know, everything Lekatsky said about the phenomenon, which is, you know, it, it broadens the aperture on the conversation crazily into seeing things that aren't there in the kitchen at Skinwalker Ranch to these ethereal beings and black spots that appear on in the middle of the road that kind of make you feel cold and full of fear and things like that that gets the stuff that we refer to as you know demonic and things like that um but we're never going to figure that stuff out if we just kind of go it's demonic and we're comfortable with that word because really that word doesn't mean anything it's just a placeholder for something we don't know similar to something like dark matter dark matter is an evil you could call it evil matter if you wanted to <laughs> um but it's just the unknown and the unknown is scary to people but just like we did when humanity started sailing the seas uh we we didn't fall off the edge of the map we found new worlds and we have the world that we have now so we kind of have to look at these things that are uncomfortable to look at to try to figure out if they're real or not Dan, grab a drink. I'm going to start reading the next question from Max. Okay. <laughs> I was listening to your interview with Kevin Wright and heard you talking about the upcoming documentary series or documentaries. A thought occurred to me while reading Imminent by Louise Elizondo about this topic of movies and series. We seem to get two kinds, documentary and sci-fi. Most of the public doesn't seem to care about documentaries and UFO news and testimonials. They, however, love sci-fi. The problem with this, with this is that it's too far in the direction of fantasy. 
I think what we are missing is a third type of entertainment, one that could actually move the masses to react and respond to the phenomenon. That would be historical drama. Think Apollo 13. Only science and history nerds will watch a documentary about this space mission, but everybody will watch a movie with Tom Hanks and amazing special effects. While reading Lou talking about historical events pertaining to the phenomenon and thinking about what James Fox accomplished with his documentaries, I imagined the book Imminent as a Hollywood dramatic film with a full cinematic treatment. In my mind, it was incredible and compelling. The entire history of UAP was brought to life as I were there seeing it with my own eyes. I was there for the US Capitol experience. I was there with Lonnie Zamora in the desert. I was there in Phoenix with my neighbours looking up at the massive craft. If we want people to care, they have to feel. I don't need to hear about the five observable observables. Bleh. I don't need to hear about the five observables. I need to experience them. That is what Hollywood does best. Sorry for the wrong email. I, I like that, Max, and I butchered it reading it out. Apologies. It's just uh, getting late. Um, but Dan, yeah, you like your movies and stuff like I do as well. What are your thoughts on that? So my media thoughts is this is what Tom DeLonge was trying to do with to the stars and secret machines and things like that to parcel these real bits of information in ways that would entertain people but they would come to know the truth of the matter um go read secret machines that's you know being made into a tv series i can't wait like it could just be dan brown you know the da vinci code but with ufos it, it stands to be something that what, what style of series would you want it to look like though because i i get the point max is making that the for example i've not watched it for decades and i should go back actually i used to as a little kid watch a a Roswell movie quite a lot. I don't know if it was just called Roswell. Um, I can't remember the name of. I think there was a Scottish actor in it. I'm not sure. Um, but I used to watch that loads as a kid. Probably not made for me. I think it was much more like grown up and maybe dry. But are you looking at a Francis Ford Coppola type, you know, three hour epic, a Christopher Nolan type Oppenheimer type movie? How, how would you make it? It would be, like I mean, it would essentially be Close Encounters of the Third Kind meets Enemy of the State. That that would be where I'd want it to hit. Something that included the kind of family angle where, you know, uh, people of all ages could go see it. But I, I would want it to feel, I say Enemy of the State, because there's a chase aspect to it and it's really gripping. Um, and you want to know what happens next. You don't want to switch off, right? Uh, so it would need to feel, it would need to draw you in as much as that, that that kind of movie did. So I don't think slow and plotting like, you know, Francis Ford Coppola or something like that, or, you know, Nolan's an amazingly technical, creative filmmaker, but his stuff is really slow and, and people, it's not for everyone. It needs to be accessible. So it almost needs to, to appeal to yeah it, it needs to not be i guess pompous does, is the does, word. It not, does it not then <laughs> maybe lose because i i get what you're saying in your head but do you not have a danger then of making it too fast-paced and actiony and it just turns into another one of those types of ufo movies it's just it's just another action movie with ufos as the topic do you know what but i mean i guess I get what you mean as well I guess that's where it, I mean it's a it's a juggling task, isn't it? Because you, you don't want it to come off bland and just boring, but at the same time you don't want it to just be one for UFO people. Um, you know, Nope was a little too slow for a lot of people, so it would need to kind of be faster than that. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any UFO films have kind of hit hit that area for me, and I can't think of any. Do you know like, what the, it, the the neatest one for me? pacing wise and tone is probably signs yeah signs is a really good example and and signs had it had breathing room to kind of let you feel that weight right almost everyone i talk to who has seen signs whether they loved or hate it we all unanimously agree and i know you do too that that scene at the birthday party with that yeah. alien just sticks with us and it will stick yeah. with us for the rest of our lives right like it was just so well done. Um, so there, there's something really potent in doing stuff like that. Um, and and I, I think you absolutely could. But it's not in doing it like the TV series Project Blue Book, which was 
really, you know, I, I love the show, but it was really for UFO enthusiasts. And yeah. that's all the need to apply. 100%. Um, same with that one that was about like the black market trade of UFO materials, which didn't really have many aliens. And like that. That, that was just that. like two or three episodes in, it was just, it wasn't going anywhere. You know, you, you could just tell. So it's not going to capture the, the audience interest. But this is why I'm so keen on Secret Machines, because I feel like there's it's a propulsive story. I think audiences have shown that they love stuff like Dan Brown that's kind of light on its foot and not too serious. Um, and, of course, Tom Hanks is in there as well, so my brain went straight there. What about a Breaking Bad-style series where over, over six series you get someone... Like, in Breaking Bad, Walter White goes from unassuming, ill school teacher to criminal mastermind by the end and it's a, an incredible evolution to watch something like that where a guy imagine like a bob lazar type story where a guy gets brought into a program over the course of six years six seasons and slowly gets exposed to more and more stuff around this world and it's really seriously done and there can be other elements of his life happens round about it but the core story instead of being you know getting really good at selling crystal meth as he gets deeper and deeper and deeper into this ufo retrieval program to the point he's really nervy nerdy scientist at first to, i don't even know why i'm pitching this to you but that maybe that kind of thing where it's i, I mean i've that. that's and cool people, you, people like get more into it in. and, yeah, you, yeah you get more into it and you see them change and become do you know what you could do the classic thing of first episode you see the dickhead general guy who, who he's absolutely terrified of and by the end the main characters became that guy he's now the guy yeah, he wants exactly feared and he gets where he's coming from now something like I, that i think that would work well uh, you've got me thinking of the show uh sugar on apple tv it was a colin farrell starring thing which is just it's just a detective show about a detective trying to find a girl and massive spoilers alert <laughs> Um, but the show, when when it came out, it was a big twist and it had an impact. But if you just Google search it now, it's just in the synopsis. Um, around episode six, you find out that actually Colin Farrell's character is an alien on Earth in disguise. But by that point, you're so invested. And there's like weirdness throughout the episodes where you're like, why? Why isn't he dying when he's stabbed? Why do all animals love him? Like he he's, seems to have some connection with people. Like, does he have powers or whatever? Um, but it stays really realistic throughout. So, you know, it could have just gone in a way like, oh, he's just a nice dude. But then the reveal happens and the show doesn't become like stupid for it. It kind of presents you with the question like and and it just steps up a notch, you know, it's just mm. like, oh, you're you're intrigued and you're invested in the character by that point. So when the twist happens and these crazier parts get introduced to it you don't switch off because you aren't into ufo stuff you, you're more like no i'm, I'm into this like that the character is really interesting and i want to keep on kind of watching to see see what happens to him next very quick sidebar do you ever sometimes watch a movie or a, a series with the same actor but they're unrelated and like to think how they could work out as being the same series for example i like to think of john wick as a continuation of the matrix series because sure. they only made three <laughs> matrix films and then it's John Wick, and that's just Neo now in, in the world where he's basically a cool assassin because the Matrix 4 never happened. Um, that's the way I like to it. <laughs> There's and, a, a particular actor that is in, like, American dramas, and this actor... Oh, political dramas, sorry. And he, this this actor, he always plays, like, a Secret Service agent. Yeah. And, and I can't remember the actor's name. It's going to really bug me. He's in 24 and he's in like the West Wing and stuff like that. But every series, his job is more serious. Mm -hmm. So when I'm watching those shows and you that actor pops promoted. up, I just assume that he's getting promoted through. Yeah. yeah. I like that. It just your sugar thing made me think of imagine Phone Booth at the end of it. The Phone Booth turned into like a, we call him Farrell, obviously, like a little craft <laughs> you've got away. And you've like, just oh. like the phone box from Doctor Who. It was excellent like a twist. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, that Roswell movie was Roswell from 1994, and it was Kyle MacLachlan. It was a Kyle MacLachlan uh, and Martin Sheen. So, yeah, might be worth I'm going gonna, back I'm and watch that at some point. Um, I'm sure I have. But... but yeah, good question, Max. Thank you for the for the 
random sidebar on that as well. Um, Matt asks, what do you guys think about what David Grush told Walter Kern about how something would quote-unquote astonish the world in the next year in combination with the event Elizondo said is being researched? Um, he sent me a YouTube clip of this guy Walter Kern on a podcast and he basically said he spent 10 hours with David Grush. Um, incredibly intelligent guy. Um, I don't know much more though other than that. Um, and I don't know about the event stuff with what Lou Elizondo is saying just now. Because I don't know with that because I think he's been very like, teasy with it. But I don't know if some of that is just not shooting down stuff he would otherwise maybe shoot down. Um, I don't know. I've had that discussion with you, Dan, about this whole 2025, yeah. 2027 thing. Um, I just don't and, and there's a lot in that. Yeah, they, there's a lot that, you know, some so, people like Lou, oh, sorry, Lou in certain interviews, when, when asked about something he doesn't know about, he doesn't just BS it. He tends to just go, I don't know about that. Like, yeah, I'll let the experts kind of take it. So, not addressing that kind of stuff just kind of tells me like one there might be something but the interviewer and lou might be talking about completely different things yeah. like you know it's vague enough that you can almost put your own wishes into into that gap so i think i think we have to be careful with projecting into that because lots of different people interpret it in different ways i i someone on the x space asked about the asteroid apophis that schedule to kind of come in the next few years and it's going to be a really close kind of near miss of a i've seen that yeah but lou said no that's not what he was talking about but that person thought that's what he was talking about so yeah we we all need to kind of be careful <laughs> in terms of projecting what we want that to be about into that space clearly something is going to happen but as lou said in the x space something always happens that's just the way that days go um and like we saw with Grush's op-ed, it was delayed. Things change. So who knows what he was talking about until he comes forward and tells us uh, we, we really have no idea. Um, Paul gave us a little bit of a brain dump. Have you been hearing about this supposed 2027 event that has been mentioned by Lou Elizondo and others? What do you think <laughs> this could be? Clear contact where UAP make it clear and obvious to us, or is it disclosure? I've heard a couple of wild theories that include perhaps a large alien ship coming clear into view of Earth where we would all be able to see it. But the craziest one is that something will happen with human conscious consciousness in 2027 that's going to change life forever. The theory suggests that we will all start to develop capabilities to communicate telepathically or some other amazing abilities and it will change the world forever. This sounds crazy, but it was a pretty cool to think about, a pretty cool to think about, and wanted to hear what you guys think about this. Cheers, Paul. Second one about us all developing developing abilities, maybe in a few thousand years' time if we haven't nuked each other. Um the we're just nowhere near as developed as a species as people think. I'm sorry, but look at just take a step back. And Google, for example, top 10 atrocities in the world right now, right? I Sorry, I saw a news story, this is horrible, where a student in the UK has had a baby, killed it, and stuffed it in a cereal box, right? So for oh me, God. as a species, we are not anywhere near, and take the up levels to what's happening across the world, um, anywhere near developed or ready for, I know that got dark, but yeah, I, I just... No, we're not anywhere near that kind of paradigm shifting moment. So not for me. Um, however, I do like that idea that, and this would be a great premise, Dan, for one of those kind of, you know, the 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 series, the left back to series, the leftovers. I love the leftovers. Right. One so, of my favorite shows. <laughs> very quick premise, folks. Imagine a series, totally straight down the line, realistic, proper drama, but the premise that you don't really get to see at first, is that in a, in a split second, is it 5% of the world's population? Uh, I think it was like 3. Like, yeah, it was a really like a low number, wasn't small it? number, yeah. 3% like of the world's population literally disappeared in an instant, as in pilots disappear from their seat in planes, babies disappear out of prams, you're, you're sitting at a dinner table and your husband and one of your kids disappear. That's the premise, and it's how the world... 2%. 2%. Two percent. It's how the world has gone on to deal with that. Okay, so it's a really like down to earth drama about a pretty incredible incident. Imagine a series or movie where the only 
hint of anything UFO related, but the whole movie is based on this, is that one day, just in the sky, not even that clear, but clear enough, everyone in New York sees a huge craft, still in space, but it's so big, like moon-shaped in daylight, goes by, and that's it. Doesn't land, doesn't stop, it just goes by, and it's picked up by TV cameras, everything, and then just how the world reacts from that. You know, because what can the government say? This thing's just gone by, which is clearly thousands and thousands of feet in length and size, and they have to acknowledge it. And that's literally the whole thing around the movie. That would be quite a cool idea. So it's funny you say that, Mike. So the book Contact, obviously, you know, the what the movie was based on. Yep. The movie doesn't go into it so much, but my favorite chapters from the book were literally that. It was just about how the world reacted to the knowledge they're not alone. They haven't made contact yet. The machine's being built and stuff like that, but it goes cool. into how people react and the way countries react and so on and so forth. And it was same fascinating. As, is that the same though as like realistically the James Webb finds lights on another planet? Yeah. We find there as a light going off every 12 hours on and off like cities. We don't, we can't get there. They can't get to us as far as we know, but we know it's there. And then just how we would react to that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And the, there was a BBC documentary last year, I think it was, maybe maybe the year before, doesn't matter, but it was recent in the last few years. Um, and the entire conceit of the documentary, it was kind of like a, a mockumentary thing, was um, it was like interviews with people like Michio Kaku and, and Brian Cox and, you know, other astrophysicists and stuff, just talking about what would happen if we, yeah. we found out that we weren't alone. And that was kind of intercut with scenes of you know scientists finding detecting a, a craft that was passing and it was just an old craft it was derelict like there was no one yeah. on it but instantly we had the knowledge that we are not alone in the universe i've seen that and it was just talking about it looks like there's nothing <laughs> on it but yeah um, <laughs> but yeah it, it was I, I remember watching it and thinking oh this would make a really cool movie yeah. or series or whatever and I it's love... funny that go on i was just so it's funny that you mentioned the leftovers just after we've talked about like do you ever combine shows and stuff because the leftovers for me is exactly what the series that marvel should have made after infinity war when end game and yeah. just live in live in that space see how the world changes after that kind of thing happen because in the leftovers two percent it was i think it was like 140 million people disappear and it changes the world in huge ways right just because they have to figure out like there's for anyone listening if you haven't seen it there's never really an answer as to what happened mm -hmm. but a lot of people have different theories and you can kind of pick your own theory by the end of the show it's about yep. the people and how they live in it and it, it would be amazing and it's funny that you mentioned that because when this question you read the question the thing i wrote was a scene from the leftovers <laughs> um where they they had really cool intros and one of the intro they had was it was kind of set way back when in a little village and this pastor was saying i've worked out the math of when the rapture is going to happen and everyone's got to climb on their roof at this point and so you see all the villagers climb on the roof it's a, a silent sequence i'm sure people can find it on youtube if you just search uh, rapture and leftovers um and they climb up and nothing happened so everyone gets off the roof and then it happens again, and the guy's like, I got my math wrong, and they go up for another day, and then it happens again, and they and every time he makes the claim it's going to happen, less and less people go up on their roofs until eventually it's just this one woman whose family's left her, and she's, you know, covered in rain and mud, and the whole village is mocking her by this point, and it, it just reminded me of that, you know, the 2027 day, or the 2030, or the 2032, or whatever, there are only so many times that we're going to get on the roof before we yeah. just kind of go, you know what, uh, enough with this. And I totally agree with you, by the way, about the not well-developed as a species. I think we we have a, a habit of kind of thinking that what we see in our lives is how the whole world is. And it's not at all. And, and I implore people to, you know, read books, listen to movies. Oh, sorry listen to interviews you wouldn't normally think you're interested in watch movies from other countries and things like that so you can see how other people are living because it's not like us right here right now mm. um you know we we are really privileged to be able to sit in a place with uh 
you know, I was going to say heating, but I know your shed doesn't have heating. But we're relatively hot, safe where we live. <laughs> like, everything's safe. There's food in the house. We have running water, stuff like that. And those fundamentals that we think of as everyday things are just not there for just such large proportions of the, the species. And then on top of that, you've got stuff like the, the incident you talked about, um, which is just insane. Um, so, yeah, we, we really need to remember it's not... It's not all love and light, and we're not all ready for whatever the next step is, and that might be okay at the same time, yeah. you know? I'm going to make a note this time next year. I'm going to release a book all about what happens after that disclosure occurs, and yeah. I'm going to call it After Disclosure. After Disclosure. AD, just AD for short. <laughs> I'm going to call it After you Disclosure. Should, you should write it under a pseudonym and yeah. just... Bryce Abel and Richard Dolan, just as one word though. Like, co authored it, but I wrote it myself, like just to make it yeah. sound really pretentious. <laughs> um, pre order available now, folks. Just pay Palmy $100 or £100. <laughs> you need to pay more in pounds, but that's uh, I like the number. <laughs> um, and finally, but thank you again, Paul. Sorry for this. You can tell it's been over two hours, 15 minutes, and it's getting a provocative late. question though. Yeah, it is. Um, and Ross finally says, apologies if you've moved on. I'm a few episodes behind, aren't we all, Ross? But the only person to send to represent mankind at an alien federation has to be the great man, David Attenborough. He's probably the only one they would want as well. Wise, representative of humans' best traits, kind and focused on what matters, our home, and increasingly likely theirs too. Are we voting on this? Winky face. Cheers. Um, folks, weeks ago, we'd said um, off of the, the back of someone's question about who would we send to represent humanity in a galactic federation. I've had a few of those through now, so thank you. If you, anyone wants to send them in, please do. But Dan, David Attenborough, you happy with that? Love the suggestion. And funnily enough, as soon as he said moved on, I thought David Attenborough, and I thought that was what was going to come up, and it did. So I don't know. It's it's 9.30. I'm, I'm getting my psychic on, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, and it's 9.30. I'm getting my I'm up for work in the morning head. So <laughs> um, Dan, we'll call it there. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a, it's been a long one this evening. Um, is there anything you would like folks to send in ahead of the UAP hearings recording? We're going to preview the actual hearings themselves. Anything you'd like to hear people get in touch with? Or... I, I think it's always nice to to hear what people both expect and would love from the hearings because the two don't always match up right so yeah let, let us know what you expect from them but let us know what you hope from them as well you know yeah and i think like you asked me earlier one of the questions on from listeners for that is who are your kind of three your kind of dream team if you could pick three people yeah. to be there so i suppose no, that would be a good one for folks to share over as well no david attenborough in those three though no no david attenborough not allowed <laughs> Although I imagine it was David Attenborough. No, I'm going to bullshit now because it's been too late. Folks, thank you very much for your time. And we'll speak to you very, very soon.